Councilmember Park. Present. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Here. Four members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And before we get started, I wanted to uh, provide advance uh, notice to my colleagues that uh, my suggestion is uh, that we move the following items, 5 through 17, 19, and 20 on consent. Uh, and uh, again, we'll let me know if you have objections to that. We'll uh, consider after public comment. Uh, and also uh, with the following recommendations to be included for item five, note and file the motion at, is it, at it has been addressed in item four. Item six and 20, to adopt the motion as written. Item seven and eight, approve the Board of Fire, Commission, uh, Fire Commissioner's report. Uh, item nine through 11, to approve the Board of Police Commissioner's report. Uh, item 12 through 17, approve the CAO report. And for item 19, note and file, the EMD report. And with that, um, I want to go ahead and take public comment. If we could please read the rules for public comment. To members of the public wishing to provide public comment, when it is your turn to speak, please state which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. And when in general public comment, you must be speaking to something within the subject matter jurisdiction of the committee. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can if you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on topic, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or if you again stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. And uh, so again, as I call your name, please line up in the queue, and uh, when you come to the mic, please provide your name and the items you wish to speak on. With that, we will begin with uh, Mr. Herman, followed by Sandra Boynton, uh, age, someone listed as AG, uh, and then Aiden Rowland. So just please come to the mic. All right, I signed up for... What's your, how did you sign up? The AG, and then AG. I signed up under one, um, two, four, um, six. Um, okay, I'll just say all items in general public comment. Okay, you've look got two it. minutes minute. for the items and one minute for general public Should comment. Should be in Go the ahead. kiosk. Um, item, so we have um, a number of grants to the LAPD because, you know, Apparently, the three billion dollars a year they get is not enough for you, uh, for the LAPD. Um, you know, they're way overfunded. Um, one penny is too much. Um, they shouldn't be getting any funding. They should be abolished. Um, just note some of the more um, noticeable ones. We have a um, s we have a twenty-seven thousand dollar grant for a laser printer. Um, why is, why is that even a thing? Why is it, or it's a $27,000 laser printer. Like, why is the laser printer that expensive? Um, so there shouldn't be any, it's like, where are you getting these, where's the LFPD getting these laser printers? Um, so there shouldn't be any money going to the LAPD and, and these backdoor grant, these grants and donations is a backdoor w way. They're doing these backdoor ways to try to get more m money without even going through the typical budgeting process. So, you know, so let's stop letting corporations fund, um, fund the police and let's, let's, not, let's not make the taxpayers fund it either. Let's just get rid of the whole system and, and replace it with things that actually keep people safe, investing in communities, um, you know, things like that. Um, so I see you're listing things as complementary strategies. Um, but, um, but there's, 
there's nothing that goes with policing. The um, the whole system needs to go down, and the there shouldn't be any funding going to the cops. Um, of course, no. Of course, all of you are um, bought and paid for, other than Ugo, are bought and paid Thank for you by for the. Your, oh, your general public comment. Go ahead. Yeah, but all the rest of you, one, Ugo, Ugo isn't. But the rest of you are all bought and paid for by the LAPPL. Um, so you you don't even care because they're they're the ones that you know funded your campaign. But um, but for. But for folks in the audience, or just anyone who's interested, just know that this the system is terrible, and um, this this commission is just uh, this committee is specifically designed to not challenge this at all, the system at all, or anything. It's just their it's the dream list of um, the people that um, um, of the council members that the LAPPL wanted. It's basically their hand-picked list. When Ugo is like the one, you know, one person they stuck on to make it look like it's not completely um, sponsored by the LAPPL. Um, and just a reminder that protesters are not terrorists. Thank you. Again, for those that I've called, please uh, be ready in the queue so that we can facilitate uh, an opportunity for everyone to have the chance to speak. Mr. Herman? Your yes. items? All items and non-agenda public comment. Okay, Mommy, two move minutes, move. go ahead, and a minute for general public yeah, comment. Yeah, fuck the police. Because due to the circumstances of safety, my understanding that a report of public safety on the committee by incentives, hard to hire civilian classifications. I don't believe that. That's why I said fuck the police service. Yeah. And that reason is because fucking police fuck young boys, such as cadets. And there's people in our community. Stick to the items that on are the agenda. Professional. Stick to the items yeah, on the agenda. I'm, I'm sticking to the to the items referred to by public safety committee. By okay, then you're taking general public comment. So we're going to move to general and, public comment. And you comment. should do black, background DNA testing before you hire General public people. comment? Pardon me? You want me to do my non-agenda public comment? All right. This is Brandenburg versus Ohio, 395 U.S., 1944, 1969. How far is the end going to? Yeah. This is what we're going to do to the end, a dirty end, moo moo cunt. Send the Jews back to Israel. Let's give them back to the dark garden. Save fucking America. Bury the end. We intend to do our part. Give us our state rights. Do you know, mommy? Do you know what our state rights are? Now you know, nigga. Because we intend to do our part. Give us our state rights. Freedom for the whites. Nigger will have to fight for every inch he gets from now on. Brandenburg versus Ohio, mommy. And by Sandra Boynton, who pointed out, moo, 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 mommy. Thank you. Arnold Sachs, Andre Vickers, Dave, Dave on, Dave Yon James. Again, for those names that I called, if you could please stand to the queue so that we can ensure that everyone who signs up for general public comment can participate in public comment. We have a, a very heavy agenda. We want to ensure that everyone has an opportunity so that we don't lose quorum. Thank you. Hi. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Aiden Roland. I am with the Brotherhood Crusade Grid Program. I am in the I like Tan Kip Scholar Academy. I'm in the sixth grade, and I'm speaking on item number two today. Number two. Okay, you've got one minute. Go ahead. Okay, so the reason why we should keep funding the Brotherhood Crusade grid program is because they teach me different things in different ways, like how I should act when I'm in outside, and they teach me how self-defense classes and more. They, they, um... 
they've helped people that need it. Like one time back a while ago, we did a homeless, we fed the homeless people on Skid Row, and then, and then we went to the movies once, they, we got taught something even though we were having fun somewhere. And we also went to a retreat, which is, they taught us how we should have communication with someone so they can always help us. Thank you. Arnold Sachs, followed by Andre Vickers. Sorry, uh, young man, you were Dave, Davion, is that right? My, my, I'm sorry, okay. Jose Hernandez, Marcus, and uh, Ricky Washington. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here in support of the 13 I'm sorry, your name and the items? My, my name is Davion James. Oh, thank you. And and I'm you're... here in support of the $13 million being in control of the, by the Office of Community Safety. It's extremely imperative that these funds are accessed by the grid office to be able to support the staff who work tirelessly day in and day out, um, putting their lives on the line. I'm one of those um, that, and, and with all my colleagues that standing behind me, we work in, day in and day out, putting our lives on the line to bring peace to this city. And it's just extremely important that we're able to access those funds just so that we can have a, a, a average living wage, right? We, we do put in a lot of time and after hours, we're, we're not compensated for those extra hours that's just put in 24 hours a day. And I think it's extremely important that we have access to those funds. We need, we, we, we need the raises. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Andre Vickers, and I'm in support of the $13 million be put in the community safety. <laughs> I support the mayor office. I'm an intervention worker and been doing this for the last 13 years. 24-7 uh, is our call. Uh, we out in the streets. We saving lives. And uh, we got to get paid. Uh, I look at y'all, and y'all look real comfortable up there. Uh, do we, is anybody making $40,000 a year up there? Because you can't survive off of that. And that's what we're making, and we're working 24-7. Uh, it passed, the $13 million passed in the mayor budget. It's allocated to go to interventionists, and that's who it should go to. It should go to all the intervention workers that work 24-7 to save lives. We all know where L.A. used to be, and it's not that no more. And everybody, when they speak about peace is coming down and the shoots is coming down, they always scream out intervention is a big part of that. Within well, is we a big part of that, then pay us a big part of that. $13 million that's allocated for us. Thank you. Thank you. Arnold Sachs, Jose Hernandez, Marcus, Ricky Washington, and Andre Christian. So what are your items you'd like to speak on? Uh, item number two, and then um, public comment. So that's then, a minute for each. Go ahead. Okay. Item number two refers to child care services. It's all about the care. It's all about Obamacare. It was the most comprehensive federal program ever created by President Barack Obama. It took about eight years for it to get funded by Congress, and then some dumb shit in South Central took that contract over. L.A. Care, L. Period A. Period Care, for low-income people, affordable care for people. They've changed Medi-Cal, a California program, from Medi-Cal to Medi-Cal. That's not the way it goes. When did it change? 
did the state legislature change it when they were talking about all these COVID-19 programs? Where is everybody's mask? I heard somebody yesterday say COVID-19 is st still prevailing. From then, I got to go on something else. Um, oh, out front media. What happened to Transito Victor? What's going on with this bus bench Please shelter? stick to the items related to public safety's purview. This is this oh, wait. Wrong room. Sorry, ma'am. The police are up being railroaded. It's all the drugs in America. He's the head of the drug cartel. He started in the 70s with Crenshaw High. His coach, Willie West, he sent some students out to University of Oklahoma, gave them some crack and some weed. He never got, the guy got caught, got sentenced for like 40 years. They don't like drugs in Oklahoma. So he decided to expand his whole operation. He made all that fucking money. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Your name and which items you'd like to speak on? The number two item. My name is Ricky Washington. I'm an ambassador for Chapter 2. I'm here before you today to ask that we continue the $13 million that was allocated for my individual workers, myself, and individual workers that, that stand behind me. We work from this every day, folks. It's a phone, a cell phone, like most of you folks have every day. We answer this phone every day, 24 hours a day when we're called. We don't have a rest moment. If you call us, you're from Los Angeles, and you need us, we're there. We'd like you to be there for us now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jose Hernandez, Marcus, Andre Christensen, and Ansar. Hi, good, good afternoon. Afternoon. good afternoon. I'm here also to speak about item two. A two? And yeah. your name, please? My name is Marcus Washington. I am also an ambassador at Chapter 2. And I'm also here today, not just for the intervention brothers and sisters that's here, but just for what's right and wrong. And uh, we fought hard to get to where we got to. I've been doing some form of this advocate work for about 10 years now. And sometimes with no pay at all, very limited pay. And I know a lot of these people I know personally, we get very limited pay. And finally, that somebody decided to do something right and advocate something for us, and here we are fighting again for it. I'm just asking that these people that fought and gave us this opportunity will stand by us today and make sure that that money is advocated the way it was supposed to be advocated for the intervention workers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Your name, please. Good afternoon, Andre Christian. Thank you. I'm going to read from this so my little man that just came up here don't beat me up too much because he really did <laughs> which, that. Uh, which item, sir? Uh, two. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Andre Christian, President of Watts Life United. I am one of many peacekeepers serving Council District 15. I am also a member of the Los Angeles Intervention Coalition. We respectfully ask that the full $13 million be placed in the unappropriate balance by Council be released to the grid before June 30th. The budget delay has had a negative impact on many of the grid-funded organizations, compromising the livelihoods of many of LA's peacekeepers. We have advocated for over two years to increase the salaries of intervention workers to 60000 a year, and these dollars will ensure that the goal is achieved. The bigger qu question is why must we almost beg for livable wages for saving lives? The city should value the work of violence intervention and provide sustainable funding to continue the vital work to save lives and ensure safety for all. Over the last 15 years, we have been essential, uh, essential in keeping LA safe, achieving a decade of the lowest rates of violence since the 1960s. Intervention workers have proven themselves as essential to public safety, therefore we. Thank you, sir. Uh, there was Ansar, Arvis Jones, Blinky Rodriguez, Carter Spikes. Yes, my name is Ansar Stan Muhammad. I am the executive director of the Helper Foundation serving in CD11. I want to thank a good friend of mine, Tracy Parks, for her leadership over on the west side. Item two, sir, or which? Item two. Okay. Today I lend my voice 
to the CIWs in the city, and I am here to support them because truthfully speaking, we shouldn't be here. We don't see law enforcement advocating for dollars every year. But for the past 25 years of doing this work, we always have to come here and advocate for monies for CIWs that's on the front line 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no guns, no badges, saving lives. We should not have to do this every year, ladies and gentlemen. I encourage this committee not only to identify and appropriate the 13 million, but we should be going after 100 million. And so after today, let's look at how we can strengthen the intervention community across the city because it's long overdue. Thank you, Ms. Parks, for your friendship. Love you guys. Arvis Jones, followed by Blinky Rodriguez, followed by Carter Spikes and Fernando Rejon. Hello, I'm speaking on item one and two. Okay, you've got two minutes. My Go name ahead. is Dr. Arvis Jones. I actually am a grief, loss, and trauma therapist. And I want to tell you, you've been hearing all these people talk about what they do. I've been watching them. One, the police call me out on the crime scenes to help families. I'm out there with these interventionists. And I will tell you, one night I got called at 12 o'clock. I look up at 2 o'clock. The mayor's office is gone. Everybody's gone. But the interventionists are still there helping those families. Then we have the GRID program that this young man is a part, part of, that I have worked with those children. It is very imperative for our youth and for our communities to continue that you pay these young men and women the funds that they deserve. I can't believe that they're not getting paid like they should be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Blinky Rodriguez. I'm the executive director of Champions and Service in the San Fernando Valley, in particular District 7, where we've done a lot of work. Um, I'm here to talk about the those dollars that need to be released, we desperately need them. You know, the, the new fiscal year is quickly coming upon us. And I also want to ma make a mention that many, many, many years ago I stood in these chambers, there wasn't a whole lot of dollars. There was no dollars even to be discussed. But they're in place now, and this work has proven that it gets it done. That's why the whole country talks about what's going on in Los Angeles. We really need the resources to be released. I'm just one other voice, been out here in, in the desert for a long time, but we know there's water and it's sitting right here and we're thirsty. People need to get paid. People need to have a livable living so they can raise their kids and family. Look at one gang homicide cost the city of LA $7 million. Go all the way back to the early, early 90s. Over 1,200 homicides in the city. Over 1,200. Before COVID, we were a little under 400. Nobody's arguing that the people standing behind me and the, this work has been a big part of that reduction. Thank so if you, you want to turn it into dollars and cents, how much have we saved the city of LA? Thank you. Carter Spikes, followed by Fernando Rejon, Greenspan, and Henna Lopez Spears. Good afternoon. My name is Carter Spikes, and I'm a community intervention worker. What I want to say to you is this. Every day, I risk my life, along with these individual workers, to save lives. I understand what I signed up for, and I accept it. I would like to ask you, it's unfair that I have to work a second job just to feed my family. It's really unfair, and I save lives. The same people who did the analytics for the LAPD to show their effectiveness also did ours and it shows that we are extremely effective and I just would like to be compensated because it's just flat out wrong that I make one dollar more than a person who works at McDonald's but two dollars less than a person who works at in and out and I save lives every day thank you thank you Good afternoon. 
Um, item number two and general comment. Mm -hmm. Two minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando Rejon. I'm the executive director of the Urban Peace Institute and a member of the Alley Violence Intervention Coalition. Uh, these men and women back here, uh, we represent 20 frontline um, gang intervention organizations that service the city and the county, um, black and brown, making sure that our communities are covered and many times the communities most impacted by violence. We're here today to ask for the full $12.9 million to be released to the grid office so that we incre can increase the salaries of intervention workers who sacrifice a lot of their lives and livelihoods in order to create peace in our communities. Um, about three years ago, the starting wage for an intervention worker was $32,000. We advocated it went up to 40. That's still not enough. There are intervention workers that are living in their cars because they cannot afford a place to live in the city of LA, but they're out there risking their lives every day. So, I'm surprised that the work of gang intervention is still questioned, uh, given the sacrifices and the efforts they make to create safety. Over a two-year period in South LA, intervention saved the city $110 million, and that's a conservative estimate. For us, thank, oh, uh, general, general comment. public comment. Yeah, thank you. We're at a point in LA's history where we know that real public safety cannot be achieved without community-based work, a community-based workforce that helped LA achieve its lowest murder and shooting rate since the 1950s. There's a 10 year period where we were below 300 homicides, which was 300 too much, and we had a vision to go down to zero. We need to stay on that vision, and as the brother Ansar said, $13 million is really just a drop in the bucket for what is needed to build out an infrastructure and redefine what public safety is in the city and county of LA. So for us, um, we're here to say that those dollars need to be uh, released um, so that people can get back on track and ensure that we can sustain the violence reduction strategies and safety efforts that have helped this city achieve uh, uh, increased public safety. Thank you. Greenspan, followed by Hannah Lopez Spears, followed by Irma Arellano, Jen Teasdale, and Jose Guerrero. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Hannah Lopez Spears, and I'm with the Brotherhood Crusade grid program, and I'll be speaking on item two. Okay, you got a minute, go ahead. The extent to which GRID has impacted me and so many youth has been and I hope will continue to be with the help of all of you, of course, extremely great. The ability the GRID program at Brotherhood Crusade has to truly connect each and every individual, not only to each other, but most importantly themselves, is immensely remarkable. GRID allows us to explore and create oppor different opportunities that expand our creative, social, innovative, and intellectual capabilities. GRID nurtures those of us who only know of hate and violence. This program feeds our souls physically and spiritually, allowing those who only know of scraps to know the beauty of a full stomach and mind. With this increased city budget, it will allow for us to grow while giving our case managers and lead case managers the room to their creative freedom to provide us all that, all that provide us all that they can. Once again, I am Hina Lopez Spears, and I hope you realize that these interventionists are the change even you all hope to see. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Irma Arriano, and I'll be speaking on line item two. Okay, one minute, go ahead. My journey started with intervention 20 years ago. 20 years ago till today, we have changed many of our hats. Our duties have changed. The only thing that has not changed is our pay. Intervention worker, case manager, program coordinators, decreasing the violence, creating peace, replacing graffiti on the walls into art on canvases, replacing thoughts of I can't and I won't into goals and dreams. In our line of duty, we encounter the unhoused. Do we just walk on by? No, we stop and provide for them. Why? Because we have compassion. I'm talking about these places that we go into. We go into hardcore places, places like an alley, places like dead ends, places where many people have been forgotten. When I say forgotten, I mean forgotten. See people focus on the problem, but never not the solution. I'm standing here today to say to please increase the wages of intervention. We respectfully ask that all positions of intervention receive an increase of salary. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, I'm 
Jen Tiza. I'm speaking on item two. I am a volunteer with Moms Demand Action. It is an organization committed to reducing gun violence in all its forms through advocacy, education, and policy. And really, there's nothing more important that I could do as a member of Moms Demand Action than to stand up and speak for the members of our community who are in the trenches every single day, our community intervention workers who, as the lady just spoke, go to places that many of us would not dare to go because they have the capacity, they have the professional training, they have the ability to get in there and make a difference. And so I urge the council, please allocate the full $13 million to the Los Angeles Violence Intervention Coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna call for the last time Jose Hernandez, then followed by Greenspan, Jose Guerrero, Juan Rebollar, Correa Lopez Spears. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Jose Guerrero. I'll be speaking on number... I'm sorry, your name, sir? Jose Guerrero. I'll oh. be speaking on item number two. Okay, you've got a minute. Go ahead. Uh, you know, everybody that's came up here spoke about our 24 hours, 24-7, and it's true. We're out there 24-7, but I also want to talk about all the hats that we wear. During the pandemic, we were out there. We were front line. We were the ones out there handing out the kits, you know, look, looking for places for people to go, our community to go to get checked, to get the COVID, the, the vaccination. You know, there's a lot of work that we do that people don't see. You know, we are out there on the streets. We are front line. We are dealing with the communities. We are helping crime come down. You know, it, it's important for us to start getting what we deserve. We do work two jobs. You know, we're away from our families, you know, and helping us get that 13 million release will help us a lot, not just for ourselves, not just for our communities, but for our families. You know, we ask right now that you guys please think about releasing them and doing us that much, you know, for everything that we've given the city and all the time that we put in, I believe that you guys can make it right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Your name, please? Uh, my name is Juan Rabollar. Okay, you, uh, what items? Uh, my item is number two and a general comment. Okay, you've got two minutes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Juan Rabollar. I am a community intervention worker with Community Warriors for Peace, serving districts one, thir 13, and 14. I know this program works. I was a client and I am now a community intervention worker. I know we save lives because it saved mine. Think about this, I pay 2,500 a month for rent that is 30,000 a year from my check and that leaves me with very little uh, for the bills and support. I support myself, my wife and my children. And the city needs to value the work of violence intervention and provide the funding we need to continue this vital work. Why do we keep fighting for this right to get paid for a livable wage? We have always been in the dark saving lives. We have not gotten credit for what we deserve. Well, I say today is the day we deserve it. Therefore, I call for immediate release of funds of the, to the grid to keep LA safe. A thank you and your best wishes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Correa Lopez Spears, Marcus Washington, Ricardo Moat. Hi. Hello. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Garia Lopez Spears, and I'll be doing two. On item two? Yes. Okay. Speak. We want to hear you. Uh, you've got a minute. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Garia Lopez Spears and I am 15 years old. I am enrolled with the Los Angeles Brotherhood Crusade Grid Program. This program has helped me find my courage and confidence to be myself and speak my mind when it's necessary. Grid has opened a lot of opportunities for me, for kids my, eye, for kids my age, with meeting lawyers, entrepreneurs, comedians, and so many more. By opening our brains and minds to new and striving environments, it has given us belief in our future. Grid has prevented kids from joining gangs and any elite illegal activity. It has shown us that we do matter. They also have given us opportunities to do internships as many different striving companies. GRID kept, keeps us busy on the path of success that we want to follow. Without GRID, kids will be lost or probably in jail. GRID continues to change my life and the lives of other kids in this program. With the increased city budget of our case managers and the lead case manager, we'll be able to receive a livable wage. We will also Make sure it will support the whole team that makes Brother Hooker say thank you. Thank you. Greenspan, followed by Marcus Washington, Ricardo Moat, Tina Padilla, 
Tracy Jones, and Ulysses Pickett. Hello, good afternoon. I'm going to speak on item number two. My name is Tina Padilla with Community Warriors for Peace, serving Council Districts 1, 13, and 14. We are a member of the Los Angeles Violence Intervention Coalition. We are asking that the full 13 million be released to the grid before June 30th. This budget delay has negative impact on many grid funded organizations. Think about this. During the pandemic, supermarket and medical fields received hazard pay. Intervention became virus interrupters and we risked our own lives and never received any hazard pay. All of us out here have given our blood because we lost many intervention workers in the line of duty. Sweat because we work 24 seven. Our phone rings at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., we answer. There is no, I'll get back to you during normal business hours. And tears because we've shed tears saving lives and tears for the lives we have lost. Intervention workers have proven themselves as essential to public safety. We're not asking for nothing that we have not earned. It is time the city values the work of violence intervention and provides the full funding to continue this vital work Los Angeles needs. Thank you very much. Final call for Jose Hernandez, Greenspan, Marcus Washington, Ricardo Moat, Tina Padilla, Tracy Jones, and Ulysses Pickett. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Ricardo Moat. I'm a with the Brother Crusade, and I want to speak on item two. Okay, you've got one um, minute, sir, go ahead. Real quickly, I just want to say the Brother Crusade has been fortunate enough to um, help over 5,000 youth past few years. Um, you've heard some of the stories of our young people that are part of our program, and I know how hard and how impactful our work is in the community. Uh, but more importantly, the city budget will allow the Brother Crusade through the GRID program to ensure that case managers and lead case managers will finally have a living wage. Uh, we know the cost of living has increased exponentially over the years, and Brother Crusade will ensure that these additional funds are invested in our team who do the heavy lifting every day. Um, the last thing I want to say, it's just uh, personal. Most people in this room will not live under the shade of the trees that they planted. And so what we're doing and the work that we're all doing is we're planting trees and we're planting seeds. And we hope we can continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I called out all the final names. Marcus Washington, Tina Padilla, Tracy Jones, Ulysses Pickett. And seeing no one, I didn't see Goat Puppet. Mr. Spindler, we'll go ahead and, and that'll, uh, after Mr. Spindler, it appears that that would conclude uh, general public comment. That's right, yes. Mr. Spindler, which items? Well, which items? <laughs> All the fucking items in general comment. <laughs> okay, you've got two minutes plus a yes, minute for general yes, public comment. Yes, that's good here. So let's see here. <laughs> What's the wrong agenda? Ow! Get the right one. <laughs> yes. Item one. Akila Cheryl is Akila Bashir. <laughs> yes, they want strategies for better policing. Are we going to police the Hugo Soto way? Or are we going to police the Tracy Parkway? <laughs> are we going to have a bunch of tents all over the place and urine and drug needles all over the place? Or nice, pretty, clean streets and nice, pretty street lights that work? This is what we're going to talk about at item one. <laughs> then we have number two, gang prevention, yes. As you know, this city council is a gang itself. <laughs> so they know a lot about it, don't they? Yes. As you know, Curran D. Price Jr. allegedly has been indicted. That makes four council seats out of the last 15 <laughs> since 2020 March. How about that? Let's give him a hand. Four of them. Hey. <laughs> yes, that's right. So as you see, um, this meeting, by the way, is brought to you by the Covington Law Firm. <laughs> For your white-collar defense needs, 
Goat Puppet recommends the Covington Law Firm. Mention Goat Puppet and you get a $100 an hour discount. How, mu how much is it? Well, they're 1200 an hour, but they'll talk to you later. <laughs> so now we get the fire department. These people don't put out any fucking fires. <laughs> no, what they do is, is they drive a bunch of trucks so Ma Grandma falls down. Help! And then four trucks come out, and then 16 firefighters get overtime for that. That's why the city's bankrupt. <laughs> yes, and now we'll get to the general comment. <laughs> yes, let us all pray for the latest council member to go down on criminal charges. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Heavenly Father, let's hope that he doesn't talk to the FBI. Let's hope that he doesn't talk to the FBI and rat out four or five other council members, <laughs> with the exception of Paul Martin Krikorian, of course. <laughs> and let us hope that at 72 years old that maybe they'll have mercy on him, like Donald Trump, for example, who gets indicted at 76 years old. See what happens, everybody? You Democrats take out one of them, and then they come around and take out one of you. <laughs> See that? It's mob rule here at the council. So who's going to be the caretaker for CD9? <laughs> Let's see here. Goat Puppet recommends Melina Abdullah take over as the interim caretaker of CD9. Hey, that's right. Finally, we will be represented Thank you. Okay, so that concludes general public comment. And uh, colleagues, I again uh, want to go back to my recommendations to take the following items on consent, uh, which was items 5 through 17, 19, and 20, unless there are objections. Uh, I'd like to call special 11 and 15. 11 and 15. 11 15. Is that it, Mr. McCosker, or any? No, no. Okay. Mr. Verano, would you please uh, move the balance uh, with the amendments and recommendations as I had previously instructed? Yes, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember McOsker. Yes. Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. These items are approved. Thank you very much. And uh, before we, I call out, uh, I, I invite to uh, the verbal presentation. Uh, from our esteemed colleagues. I want to first uh, address and thank all the uh, intervention workers uh, that have joined us today in public safety committee meeting. Uh, I also want to thank the young people that came out to participate in providing public testimony. I want to help address and uh, help provide greater clarity about the process of our budget and allocating resources and what the subsequent actions are of this committee. Now, as a budgetary process, the, what is already funded and scheduled to be funded as part of the programmatic work of GRID was adopted as part of the budget. As a reflection of the increased allocation, what the standard practice is, is that the members of this committee better understand and ascertain the details of how those dollars are to be applied. Uh, to be clear, not all the $13 million that was proposed for the increase are going to salaries. There is actually uh, resources that are being broken out or proposed for breaking out for different portions of the grid program. So I just wanted to provide some clarity because the suggestion that it's uh, the whole purpose of this conversation is to provide greater clarity on how these dollars are to be expended and how, they're, uh, how they are to be applied because that, cr that clarity was not provided in the budget process when it was first proposed. And so that is why we're here having that conversation today for, any who's, for anyone who's under any, under, and under any misunderstanding, to be clear. Uh, the suggestion, uh, as it was raised, that there's still a questioning of the effectiveness of uh, the GRID program and whether or not any member of this council uh, believes that is blatantly a false statement. And so I just wanted to provide that clarity because I think with the individuals that are about to present uh, this afternoon, you're going to see that, in fact, the city is making even greater commitment to assure the safety, the training, the preparation of the intervention workers because there's tremendous value and recognition of the work that the intervention workers provide. So I wanted to make sure that I provided and addressed uh, some of what I think was misrepresented in some of the statements 
uh, because I think so often it gets uh, perhaps, you know, for whatever reason, uh, those uh, sometimes is miscommunicated. And so I wanted to provide greater clarity and understanding about what we have before us today because it will provide greater details about how those dollars are about to be uh, committed uh, for this next fiscal year's budget. So I just wanted to take my moment to, uh, as chair, to provide clarity for those that are under uh, misunderstanding. And with that, uh, Mr. Verano, would you please call item number one? Item number one is a verbal presentation from Akila Shirelles and Akil Bashir on community-based public safety as a complementary strategy to policing. Gentlemen, if you please come to the... Uh, Mr. Sherrills and Mr. Bashir. Um, first of all, thank you so much. It was, uh, it was my great honor to have you in uh, City Hall earlier this morning during council. Uh, you were clearly welcomed with incredible open arms by members of the City Council because in recognition of your longstanding history in being the original peacekeepers uh, in the city of Los Angeles with a long history emanating in South Los Angeles but throughout the city of Los Angeles. Um, I had the great privilege for members of the public that are not familiar uh, with my role as public safety chair or some of the work that we've been in, engrossed in doing in the last several years. Uh, had the opportunity to go look at what uh, Mr. Shirelles has done uh, by going in, into the work into Newark, New Jersey. And uh, even as part of the President's, uh, President Biden's efforts on community-based public safety initiatives, really looking at a model of how we create greater systems, support for the intervention workers as part of our strategy to assure that the intervention workers are supported and trained and resourced with the tools that they need to be more effective in their roles so that we can provide the uh, complementary resources that are needed. Uh, I was incredibly impressed with the work uh, and the systems that you've helped cr to create out in Newark, New Jersey. Um, so much so that it was on the, in my return from that trip and visiting in the sweltering heat of, uh, of uh, that trip, and that uh, I came back and allocated uh, the resources that have bailed you both the opportunity to provide the training and support services to our community intervention workers through Project TURN. And so colleagues, with that, um, without belaboring this, I want to just say that uh, what we have before us today are two gentlemen that have been, uh, have a longstanding history in doing community intervention work, uh, providing peace on streets, not just here in Los Angeles, but across the country have been, uh, frankly, incredibly uh, successful in imparting the lessons that are learned and the best practices, not just from Los Angeles, but to those areas where they have subsequently gone out and trained. Uh, but more importantly, they've created a holistic approach in many of these areas, aligning the services for victims, for young people, to help have a collaborative approach, not a, not, not you know, again, we're talking about systemic reform. And systemic reform is happening in this process right now through Project TURN. Uh, and I want to thank you for, uh, for your responsiveness to the RFP that we issued as a result of the money that I uh, fought to, uh, to avail in the Project TURN program. And with that, I'm going to give you the floor and talk about Project TURN, give a little bit of a background. I, I gave a little bit, but I want to go ahead and turn it over to you both uh, to uh, provide this discussion. Thank you so Thank much, you. Madam Chair. Um, and, you know, to the council, um, you know, thank you all so much uh, for your leadership in the city in terms of providing strategic investment for community violence intervention or community-based public safety, what we like to, to call it. Um, you know, for years, uh, for decades, they called our work gang intervention and crisis intervention. Um, but last year, um, about 20 thought leaders from all across the country got together and we defined our work as community-based public safety, right? Because we see what we do as a complementary strategy to policing in cities. Um, you know, intervention, you know, has been around for, to close, uh, for close to 30 years now with evidence-based support, with anecdotal support. You know, the, the men and women, I just want to, you know, stand up and salute. Your 
and so, you know, as, as, the, as the councilwoman shared, you know, she's been um, the champion, you know, of the reform efforts, right? You know, I think that we can all say honestly that, you know, LA started out as the premier city for community-based public safety and sure. how um, these efforts function. I, I was a young person, you know, in the, in the late 1980s, early 90s, when myself and my brother and a group of friends, um, many of the folks who are here were instrumental in organizing the peace treaty and watched that change the quality of life in our community. In the first two years, gang homicides dropped 44%, right? Um, and the city initially adopted our overall strategy. It was the research that was done, you know, by, by George Tita, by, by David Kennedy, that really lifted up our work and, and expanded it across the country. So we saw Bridges One and Bridges Two. And then with Villa Nagosa, we saw it become the Gang Reduction Youth Development Program. And now, you know, with the support of, you know, Councilwoman Rodriguez and the mayor, we're seeing, you know, um, a whole new level of investment um, in, in terms of our collective work. And so just to say a few more things about, you know, um, the places that I've been in terms of this work. Organizing the Peace Treaty in LA in 1992 was a stepping stone. Um, Co-founding Hall of Fame, uh, Amir I can with Hall of Fame, uh, the late Hall of Fame, uh, great Jim Brown. Some of you all might know this Saturday we're going to be celebrating uh, Jim Brown's life, um, who launched Amir I can. And before the advent of social media, we were in some 15 cities across the country doing community violence intervention work. Yes, sir. Um, in 2014, um, my good friend Ras Baraka, who's the, the mayor, the honorable mayor of the city of Newark, uh, tapped me to come and build out his community-based public safety initiative because of the years of our work um, back and forth in LA. Um, some of you all might not know this, but in Newark, New Jersey, um, Grave Street was the biggest crip gang in the city and in the state you know, of New Jersey. And so we were able to leverage those relationships, hire the practitioners in the field, ex-gang members, ex-convicts, ex-drug dealers, a similar strategy that we use in LA. And we developed a three-pronged strategy, high-risk intervention, assertive outreach, and victims' advocacy. Um, with, a, with a modest grant, um, 16 independent contractors, you know, those men and women who live in those neighborhoods where violence was, um, you know, high, we, we launched our work. And in the first two years, we had a 12% reduction in homicides. Today, Newark has had now seven consecutive years in a row of decreases of homicide and overall violence. We, we removed Newark from the top 10 most violent city list where they had a coveted position for almost 50 consecutive years. And the mayor's charge to me was to build infrastructure, put systems in place, and turn it over to the local folks, mm -hmm. right? And so today, the Newark Community Street Team is the anchor nonprofit in the South Ward. Um, we have over 130 staff. Um, we'll do probably about $10 million this year. This is a seven year, this is seven years ago we launched this initiative. All of our staff have been highly trained through the Professional Community Intervention Training Institute in conflict resolution, mediation, de-escalation strategies. We work through the public health lens. We understand that violence is a disease, and we approach it from that frame. We believe that those who are closest in proximity to the disease have to be equipped with the skills, the tools, and the resources to do the intervention, the prevention, and the treatment. And, and we, we provided those type of support services, and this is why we've seen the success in Newark. Um, as a direct result of our work, um, the White House then tapped um, uh, myself and some of our colleagues to launch a 16-city um, uh, uh, initiative, Initiative, 18, 18 months, to build the capacity of community violence intervention agencies to serve as complementary strategies to public safety in their respective cities. LA was one of those cities. Many of the individuals here and their organizations participated in the process. And, and it was phenomenal. 52 organizations across those 16 cities um, participated in the process. We were able to move um, many grants to those organizations, provide um, comprehensive training and technical assistance plans that became roadmap for these agencies, and then organize some 14 national philanthropic organizations to move dollars um, to support, because public dollars is, is, is important for long-term sustainability of this work, right? Philanthropic dollars help to to incubate and seed innovation in terms of the, in terms of the work. So, so we were fortunate that we ran the White House initiative and coming right out of that, we partnered with Steve Bomber and the Bomber Group, uh, Stephen Connie Bomber and the Bomber Group, Schusterman Foundation, and received the 25 million 
five-year, 12-city initiative in which LA would be a part of cohort two in terms of drilling down in terms of supporting our agencies build capacity um, um, in terms of the work, right? And, and so with that, I wanna, I wanna give um, an update you know, on the project that we launched here in LA in partnership with the, with the councilwoman to really look at the infrastructure support that, that grid agencies need, right? During Civic, we discovered that about three-fourths, about three-quarters of the 14 agencies that we're working with in the city didn't have stable fiscal infrastructure. Um, infrastructure. Most of our agencies had, had um, intermediaries or, 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 or fiscal administrators, which is fine, right? Um, but a lot of our agencies only had one funding source, and that was the city of LA. And so our, our, our desire is not to, to, um, to supplant anything, to get rid of anything, but is to enhance and strengthen the, the, the existing infrastructure that exists within the city. And so Project Turn has a three-pronged strategy, right? It's to, you know, safety is a shared strategy, and so therefore we have to build out the ecosystem around safety. So we have practitioners in the field, we have outreach workers that are providing services to young people and mentoring through a case management model. We also want to ensure that there is victim services and advocacy to support survivors in their respective healing journey. We also want to make sure that, that people have access to therapeutic services. The practitioners, as the brothers and sisters were saying, are risking their lives on a daily basis. The trauma that they experience every day, tr the, the hypervigilance and, and vicarious trauma, um, goes unaddressed in many cases. And so Project TURN, um, and it stands for Therapeutic Unarmed Response to Neighborhoods, has been instrumental in providing um, an initial training to give folks tools to put in their, in their attache case so that when they get stressed out, they can go in and pull those things out um, to utilize them in order to, to stabilize in the moment. We also provided um, standardization and, and, and protocols in terms of intervention work and how it operates in the field. So we were fortunate to partner with BUILD and the Professional Community Intervention Training Institute. I, I've worked with Dr. Akil Bashir in, in, <laughs> in some 20 cities across the country in sure. terms of training boots on the ground, um, no matter what city we go to, a 211 is a 211 in, in Chicago and in Detroit. A 187 is the same thing in Pittsburgh as it is in, in Miami. And so in, in terms of developing standards and, and, and protocols, you know, if, if you've gone through the PCITI training, you know what the four W's in the HR. You know what aroma taco is. You know what the acronym STOP means, right? These are the type of protocols that we want to put in place as we professionalize the movement and take it to the next level, right, in terms of being able to draw in a larger investment, because I agree 100% with, with all of our brothers and sisters here today, that, that today, you know, um, I, I think with the, with the $13 million grid stands at about maybe $40, $42,000 a year, we should have about $100 million. I mean, um, $42 million. We should have about a $100 million investment, right? But we have to make sure that, that we have all of the, 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 the systems in place to support it, right? We got to have comprehensive evaluation. We have to have baselines and, and, and looking at impact. We got to make sure that, that our agencies have diversified funding bases, that it's not just the city grant, that it's philanthropic dollars, it's corporate dollars, it's individual donor campaigns, it's federal um, investment, you know, it's state investment, right? So that we can actually continue to build this work. Um, and, and, and with that, I, you know, I can spend a lot of time talking about the work, but we've worked with, um, with 13 agencies, over 100 practitioners in the field. Um, you know, the response that we've gotten thus far has been um, just, you know, phenomenal. And, and we want to continue this work, you know, with the council, with the city, with all of the practitioners as we evolve, um, you know, the, the community-based public safety um, ecosystem. With that, I'll turn it over to my, my brother. Thank you, sir. Uh, Council, it's an honor to be here. Madam Chair, uh, much respect to you and what you did. I want to also uh, give kudos to the mayor and to the entire city council for uh, trying to create a type of infrastructure that's going to really define the benchmark that uh, this city stands on. At one time, this city did lead the charge. Uh, I need to, before I go any further, say to my brothers and sisters in the back, uh, they're family to me. And let me be real clear.
to Achilles' point, expressing so well, when we look at what has been established, when we look at the national narrative, when we understand that our movement has evolved from where it used to be 20, 30 years ago into comprehensive community-based public safety, which means that we have lived experience at the forefront bringing complementary strategies to the table, uh, bringing the type of uh, operational structure and protocol that says we demand to be a part of the public safety because of the expertise that we bring to the table. Akila laid out the framework so well. Now, where does your training component fit into all this? The training component is that glue that brings everything together. The training component de designs the value system that the people within that structure should operate from. I think the training component is uh, so, so short time and time again. The training component defines the behavior and the operational uh, input that people think from, operate from, and move from. The training is what sets in place the boundaries and the infrastructure that uh, defines what those uh, components stand for. When we talk about community-based public safety, we're talking about a whole nother level of expertise that defines the professionalism, that defines the uh, credibility, and most importantly, that defines that the value of our people on the ground matches the, the systems that are currently in place. But without that structure, without that protocol, without that blueprint, uh, you're operating from an emotional perspective as opposed from a strategic perspective. I think uh, what uh, Project U-Turn was able to do was show that those complementary strategies, not only within the public safety system, have to be valued, but within our own work. We cannot move as silos in this work and think people are going to respect it for the level of professionalism. We have got to create the universal standard that defines what we stand for, how we operate, and that warrants the respect that is due to this work that we haven't been able to garner for over 50 years since this work evolved. So I think when you look at uh, uh, what this whole nexus is trying to bring to the table, we have to understand that achievement-driven collaboration is the only way we're going to meet the needs in our communities. It's no one entity, no one operation that has the capacity to meet all of these needs that our traumatized communities are going through. It's going to take uh, the governmental structure. It's going to take boots on the ground. It's going to take our mental health uh, experts. It's going to take our human developers. And then our systems that we design are going to have to lead that process. See, we've been too people driven in this work. No people are going to lead us to where we need to go because real leadership understands that this role is temporary. Real leadership understands that a mistake made twice is a decision. And what we're trying to do with this infrastructure, with this ecosystem that has been created around the nation is establish that benchmark to where when we look at the work, the work defines itself with the excellence of uh, infrastructural operation, with the excellence of human development in terms of the people that engage in the work. We have to be able to place ourselves in any given environment and stand on this work uh, unapologetically to let everybody know while we work with you, we can stand on our own and we can move this work forward. So I think the outstanding work that has been done, uh, I think where we need to go is to truly understand any system, inclusive of the grid, uh, has to look at itself from an inflectionary point. We have to say, are there components within that structure that we could be better? If we're going to claim that level of professionalism, which everybody here should claim, we have got to stand on that. We have got to be able to go in any environment and show why we are professionals so we won't have to continuously talk about trying to define ourselves for whether it be for money, for whether it be the understanding of what we represent, uh, et cetera. So as we move forward, as we look to where we attempt to go, we have got to not only create the ecosystem that's in alignment with the national narrative, uh, 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 Los Angeles should be at the forefront in the driver's seat, in that front seat, like it has been for decades. So we need to define that ecosystem. We need to make sure we got a collaborative regional perspective that can operate city to city. And then thirdly, we need to make sure our people on the ground are the best with the best tools, with the best expertise. And I think that's going to take uh, Project U-Turn, it's going to take the mayor's office and their excellent work. It is going to take all of us to realize at the end of the day, 
If we are going to truly serve these marginalized communities and the traumatized people within these communities, it is bigger than all of us and we must collaborate and come together and establish that unified collectability that says we stand for these communities and the people within these communities. I turn it back to my colleague, Akila. And, and I, with that, I'll, I'll just, um, because we'd love to like engage folks in dialogue because I'm sure that there's some questions, comments, and concerns that folks might have. Um, but we just wanted to close and say that, that, you know, council, that we support the practitioners 150% in calling for the $13 million um, to be released um, because $60,000 is not even, it's barely a living wage in the city of Los Angeles. And we, we want to get those numbers up. So yes. we just want to say that a, um, we stand in solidarity with the movement yes, and to make sure that, um, you know, along with our expertise that we're going to bring to enhance all of our respective um, you know, uh, practitioners and their respective organizations um, to the next level and making LA again, um, you know, a first class city in, in terms of community based public safety. Thank you so much. I, I want to go ahead and open it up for questions, but first I want to actually tap on a couple of points that you made. Um, number one, uh, when you talked about what you've managed to build in Newark uh, over the course of seven years, now Newark, for those of you that are unaware, is not even the size of one council district here in the city of Los Angeles. So just to put the scale for you to understand. 300,000. What, what, and so uh, $10 million over seven years for uh, an area that is composed of about the same population of a single council district in the city of Los Angeles, do the math, okay? So, and, and I say this with respect to the fact of all of the additional support services that have also been built into your program, because it isn't just the intervention workers. That's right. It is the, uh, the trauma-informed care and the support yes. services that come with that. It is the, uh, or the, 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 um, the professional training of yeah. these individuals, the reporting, the leveraging of uh, additional resources from the state, uh, victim services, you name it, it's a whole spectrum. It is not one piece of it. Right. And so I, I just want to underscore that because when we talk about how we approach this work as a systematic approach to how we address public safety across the city, now we don't have public health here in the city of Los Angeles. We have to rely on the county of Los Angeles. How are we going to integrate all of these functional pieces so that we have a comprehensive system that gets to the root of what we need to do in this work? And that's what was so important with bringing on Project Turn so that we could identify within our current infrastructure of all these agencies that are contracted to provide services with GRID. We wanted to get the trauma-informed care and support services to these intervention workers because we know what the experience is when they themselves are intervening in trauma, the trauma that it inherently inflicts and causes in them. And that's what the purpose of, uh, of this work was, a portion of this work. But one of the other pieces that you indicated was three quarters of the 14 agencies that uh, were part of this initial pilot you indicated lacked the stable, uh, the, the stable infrastructure to be able to leverage additional resources. Now that's an important fact for us to recognize and understand that in order for us to provide additional resources, it's incumbent upon us creating the infrastructure and support for the agencies that are doing this work to be able to receive it because it's with accountability that these additional resources will be provided. And I think that's an important part of the conversation of why we are investing, and Project Turn was an investment to help support that infrastructure so that additional resources could be provided. And so, yes. I, I, so if you would uh, kindly provide, uh, just you know, a, as an intro to that that piece of the conversation, um, and I know Mr. McCosker is just eager to to ask questions of his own, but uh, I, I wanted to uh, invite again. Could you provide some context and feedback from uh, the trainings that you provided? I think sure. um, what the participation was, what the response was, and where you see opportunities for us to, this was again the first time we've ever done this, yeah. uh, where we expand this from here. Yes, um, so I'll, I'll start just in terms of um, the therapeutic services and support services. Um, as you said, you know, Councilwoman, um, in Newark, you know, we, we built out a 
total ecosystem for safety. Um, NCST launched the city's first hospital-based silence intervention program, the city's first community-based trauma recovery center, the city's first non-law enforcement response to OD, the city's first safe passage program. We're in 22 schools now. Um, and all of these, all of these services are, are networked. You know, there's a referral system that runs through them. We utilize Apricot as a CRM to manage all of the data. Um, you can almost guarantee that any of our high-risk interventionists, if, you, if they talk about mediation or mediating a conflict in the field, somebody's going to follow up and say, is it documented? You know, because we recognize that a lot of our funders aren't there when we're doing the work in the field, and we got to make sure that we document our services so that we take credit for our work. Because traditionally, you know, when we don't take credit for our work, someone else does, right? And so for Project TURN, we wanted to make sure that we start building out that, uh, that therapeutic infra um, infrastructure to support practitioners in the field. So, you know, through, you know, Dr. Gilbert and, and, and Sage, we've been um, doing quarterly trainings um, with all of the, the, the GRID staff. Uh, I mean, uh, the practitioners um, who are funded through GRID um, to learn things like 478 to learn very practical self-regulation tools in, in, in terms of, you know, when you're doing this work in the field and you get triggered, you know, your trauma is triggered, that you have some skills and, and some tools to be able to utilize to self-regulate. Um, we also set up a 24-hour hotline so that practitioners can actually call in, you know, um, when they need support um, and, and have someone who is highly trained, who understands, um, you know, some of the trauma experiences that they're going through to be able to support them. We also, um, you know, funded um, healing circles, you know, through this work that happens um, in the respective cohort areas, right, across the city. Um, th th you know, ju just in terms of the response that we received back, you know, from those who participated, you know, um, you know folks were like, hey, we've done trauma trainings before. You know, however, um, rarely have we gotten trainings that we can actually utilize, that, that we've gotten practical skills that we can actually utilize for us. Most of the trainings that we got was for our clients, you know, and our participants, and not so much for ourselves. Um, and, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Akil to talk about um, the PCITI uh, training. And, you know, uh, Madam Chair, um, I would, if we had time, let the people that we train speak for themselves and speak for what they gathered from the training. This is not to take anything away from anything that was already established. What it is to say is we have to have a holistic approach and bring in all expertise to make sure at the end of the day, all of these needs that the community has can be met. Training is fundamental because we've got to make sure our people come home at the end of the day. We have got to make sure as they step into the fire, they can get out of that fire, they can get back to their homes, and they can have some uh, resilience of recovery from this vicarious trauma that we deal with ongoing within this movement. In terms of that capacity uh, uh, building, uh, Aquila has done an outstanding job of building uh, certain systems that not only we are operating in New York, but we're operating in the 8th Ward in Washington, D.C., in Seattle, Washington, in Milwaukee. I can go on and on and on. So this is not a silo to just one area. The model that's been uh, built in Newark has really set the example for so many other cities. When the 17 City Initiative came into fruition, it was to create some type of consistency of our work across the nation. It wasn't to say we are going to cookie cutter this approach, but what it was to say is we have to have a universal framework, and then as we step into each of these communities, those communities are tailored, but there is the reference point of that framework that we can say that this is what all our people are operating from. The capacity building is so important. As we draft the organizations and how they move forward, this is where the city plays a monumental role, et cetera, and I think this is why additional funding is also so important. These uh, smaller agencies have to have a voice at the table, they have to be able to build their capacity to where they can stand on their own, and they have to be able to take the lead when need be. It shouldn't be one or two or three organizations doing that. We have to holistically create uh, that, uh, that, that, that uh, infrastructural componentry that can allow these organizations to do just that, as well as the individuals in the humanistic transformation. I think Project Turn, U-Turn has really uh, allowed us to go into that area and really breach out and bring some of these uh, holistic uh, components to the table uh, that are being utilized effectively across the nation. We are at an inflection point, 
And if we don't get in front of that inflection point and make sure that we are not operating just from the perspective of Los Angeles, Los Angeles has to be able to define itself on the national scope and has to be able to put, present itself as a lead component in this whole circle of this new envisionment of CIW, Comprehensive Community-Based Public Safety. And, and I, I just want to just add that, that LA has great infrastructure in Bones, you know? Um, and so we, we want to, again, strengthen and enhance our existing infrastructure. You know, we, we have, so what we do is complementing what's already in existence, right? We have yes. UPI, you know, um, LaVita training. We got, you know, the, the National Institute of Criminal Justice Reform who does these analysis and cost of violence reports that provide data to cities. We have the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention that sets up hospital-based violence intervention programs and connects them to street outreach, right? Th there are multiple models across the country. Advanced Peace, you know, there's, the, you know, um, Cure Violence Global. There's a national network for safe communities with David Kennedy. All of these agencies have powerful pieces that they developed you know, that are extremely important in terms of supporting this, this ecosystem. And then there's research and evaluation. For Project TURN, we, we're fortunate that we have Dr. Cheryl Grills and her team from, um, from um, uh, the university out in... She's out in... Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the university, Dr. Charles Grills, who don't need an introduction, who is a, who's a legend in this city, right? Um, um, we have Dr. Georgia Leap and Kara, you know, who has been working with us on the national um, um, TTA work, training and technical assistance work with the federal government. So we, we you know, we have all of this infrastructure in L.A., you know, and, and so we, we've been talking with our good sister, Deputy Mayor Karen Lane, about how we pull all of these pieces together you know, so that we present a united front, you know, um, a black and brown united front, especially in terms of safety in our respective communities. And, and we know that, uh, that, you know, that you all are leading the way in terms of leadership on it. And so we want to make sure that we lend our voice um, and our expertise um, to this conversation so that we could, again, make L.A. a first-class city in terms of community-based public safety. And I would just land on that also. Uh, with your expertise, with the mayor's expertise, uh, with most of the city council, we have uh, some, some brilliant minds at the table. If we cannot set the benchmark that others will measure themselves by, that is on us as a city. We have the expertise. Uh, I have to say, and I can speak for Akilah on this, we come in here with no bones. We, we have nothing we're trying to take away from this with the exception of we believe in this city and believe in the people in this city and want to change the narrative in so many of these communities. Uh, we have to do this. It's not a matter of an, 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 a choice. It's an option. Well, it is I, an option. I think, and I, and I, if I, I, might, I must interject at this point with, and just suggest that anyone that suggests that you're trying to uh, thwart or upend the work, you see the good bones of what the work that we have. That's right. But to suggest that there is uh, that reform is not something that anyone is absolved from doing would be wrong. That's right. uh, you don't get engrossed in work, whether you're in a, whatever a nonprofit organization. Everyone adapts and grows to accommodate the needs and the changing demands of the time. Yes. And so the expectation and what the purpose of this work was was to help adapt the agencies that have been unable to grow. That's right. and be able to sustain themselves and leverage additional resources. So anyone that re represents something different is it's just blatantly false. That's right. um, and so I think that's, it's an important part of the conversation because we also didn't have a youth development department uh, two years ago. There's a lot of work that's being done in this city to onboard right. additional support and resources for young people to give alternatives and options so that we can help put an end to this. You know, we, we spend too much in incarceration. We need to spend more on the front end to making sure that we're supporting young people, that we're meeting people where they are, and helping to put them on a greater path. This work is to help capture those individuals, be those violence, inter violence interrupters, but to also help change the course for many of the individuals in our communities. But it is a complementary strategy. Yes, ma'am. And so th the suggestion that anyone makes uh, that it's whatever, for whatever false reasons, it, this is a, you know, this is not a divide and conquer. This That's is right. a unite yes. and conquer. And how are we going to invest in greater strategies, proven strategies yes. that work to show accountability so that we can better resource this work 
and make these agencies even more effective in the work that they do. Well, can and I so say one last thing, uh, Councilwoman? Uh, to that point, if we're going to claim professionalism within the uh, community-based public safety uh, system and structure, we have got to be in a constant state of refinement. We mm -hmm. have got to be trying to make sure that uh, we perfect our skills, perfect our expertise. People within the public safety structure, they consistently drill, they consistently refine protocol, they consistently build out different narrative that they operate from based on the current situations as well as past situations. So what we're looking to do is make sure uh, the soldiers and soldierettes on the street have that same capacity to where they can go into any uh, environment Environment, whether it be the White House, whether it be any city, et cetera, and sell their wares and show that they bring this level of professionalism to the table. If we can only operate in LA, we're doing a, a serious disservice. We should be able to take this expertise and this work anywhere across the nation and make sure that we can assist all of these other cities as well as they being able to assist us. I'll leave with this. Um, you know, uh, we'll never reach a state of perfection, but the road to get there is excellence, and that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Mr. McCosker, did you have any questions? Thank you. It's been, thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's been such a great discussion. I think a lot of the questions or observations I've had have been addressed. I'll be just really, really brief. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership on the TURN program because it occurs to me that in public safety, it's really important to, to address, you know, mental and physical health and certainly in community-based public safety, public, you know, community-based safety, we have the same need, maybe a greater need. That's right. Yes. Maybe a greater need uh, because of this, the lack of resources, which goes to the next point. I'm intrigued by the discussion on uh, training and technical assistance and the idea of sustainability for the long run. So I, I appreciate that very much. Um, and Mr. Bashir, you just made the, the point that I w was really ringing to me that, that we spend so much time in, in training and making sure that we have the state of the art. Uh, we do that, you know, in-house, if you will, with yes, uniform sir. personnel. We need to make sure that we're doing that with our partners. So I just really appreciate this discussion and look forward to more of it. So thank you very much for being here. Thank, thank you, you Councilman. Thank you. Mr. Soto Martinez. Yes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I, I would just want to say just thank you for all the amazing work there, your passion. I mean, you come here and you speak with so much enthusiasm. Um, you know, that's not lost upon me. I, I, as you know, I grew up in South Central and Watts, and so yes, all the work you've done, I, I've seen it firsthand. And also to uh, Madam Chair, thank you for bringing here for this presentation. I think it really gives a real breath of all the work that, that you're leading on the city, and I, I'm really grateful for it. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And, um, and, and your presentation segues very nicely into item two, uh, because again, the, the continuum of work that, need, that we need to do in this city isn't just in one-time salary increases. It's about the sustained outcomes that come with the work and the professionalization and the support systems that need to be created. That's right. And so with that, yes. I want to thank you for uh, thank you. for all of your efforts in this initial rollout of Project TURN. I think it's important that everyone understands the responsibility that we all have uh, for us as fiscal stewards, but more importantly, to make sure that we're working to refine our systems to be more responsive to our community's needs. And so with that, I just want to say thank you both very much for coming. I know Mr. Mr. Shirelles is everywhere, uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to thank you both for making the time and for your incredible work with all the practitioners here in the city of Los Angeles in the launch of Project TURN. I look forward to the, the you know, subsequent reports that will come from the work that you continue to do. Thank you Thank so you much, Madam Chair, you. for your leadership, you know, for being a champion for this yes. work. Um, and uh, we went to 150%. Let's roll. Thank yes. you. Thank Loves you. That. Thank <laughs> you very much. And so with that, uh, Mr. Verano, if we please call item number two on the agenda. Item number two is a city administrative officer report relative to the fiscal year 2023-24 budget for the city's gang reduction and youth development program and related matters. Thank you. And I know Ms. Lane is here and oh. oh, the CAOs are presenting. Okay. Never mind. Got it. Thank you. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, Chair, committee members. My name is Julie Jacoby. I'm with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. 
Before you is a CAO report on the gang reduction and youth development program and the 12.9 million requested increase for 2023-24. This is in response to council action during the 2023-24 budget process in which the proposed increase was transferred from the general city purposes budget to the unappropriated balance. Um, I'd like to go over the recommendations in the report. Um, number one, approve a total budget of $41,373,869 for 2023-24 for the Gang Reduction and Youth Development Program. This includes a $12.9 million increase from the $28,453,000 included in the 2023-24 General City Purposes Budget. <coughs> And recommendation number two, to instruct the city controller to place on the agenda of the first regular council meeting on July 1st, 2023, or shortly thereafter, an instruction to transfer appropriations for the gang reduction and youth development program in the amount of $12,920,869 from the unappropriated balance to the general city purposes budget, and to transfer therefore to the mayor's office fund in the salaries account in the amount of $120,870 and the contractual services account in the amount of $12,798,999. Um, I'll also provide an overview of the total $41 million proposed budget. Of the $41 million, $2.28 million will be allocated for administrative costs to support salaries for mayor's office grid staff, as well as printing and binding, travel, and an office and administrative costs. The largest amount in this line, in this uh, proposed budget is for contractual services, which is a total of about $35.1 million. For summer night lights, it's a total of $3.85 million and for the gun buyback program, $100,000. And to provide a breakdown for the $12.9 million requested increase, uh, it is $4,650,064 for contractual services, which includes about 2.5 million salary increases for community intervention workers, about $2.2 million for salary increases for case managers. For seasonal community intervention workers, an increase of $2.86 million. For the summer night lights expansion, $2.4 million. For Cal State LA for research and evaluation services, it's $170,366. For social solutions, $359,279. The gun buyback program, $100,000 to provide gift cards as incentives. For the turn program, $926,103. Oh, $926, for reimagine and search to continue this program, $500,000. For juvenile diversion, $333,000. For violence intervention training, $500,000. For increase in grid staff salaries, $121,870. And we have um, representatives from the mayor's office, Karen Lane and Gabriella Jasso here. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the council members as well as to the CAO. Um, I also want to extend uh, just great gratitude to all of the agencies that have um, not only been here today, but have uh, come out uh, for the last month um, to, in, to one, um, to express uh, their leadership in the city uh, but also uh, to advocate on behalf of themselves. And so um, it's not about uh, GRID and GRID being a mayor's program, but instead I think uh, the power in this room is about uh, fighting for communities, uh, lifting community voices, lifting the lived uh, experiences, um, and a shared vision for the future of Los Angeles. And so I'm grateful uh, for everyone that has come out um, 
in the midst of there being a great uh, need in the community, uh, these interventionists, case managers are leaving that work uh, to be with us not only today, uh, multiple times during this process. Um, I'm appreciative of the CAO. I think they've laid out a lot in this report. Uh, I do want to make a point of clarification. 90% uh, of the grid budget supports contractual services. And those contracts support the payroll of over 400 case managers and community intervention workers. And so when agencies behind us give public comment around the urgency of this matter, um, what they are very clear about is that many, many of them, as a courtesy to the people that they employ, because they do not have a contract in place um, and do not, cannot say for sure whether they will have resources to support their payroll on July 1st, have also started to give layoff notices. So your decision today is in fact decisive of whether GRID can execute contracts um, for the same amount that they've had in the past fiscal year, whether we need to reduce uh, those contracts, and or whether those contracts will reflect an increase in salaries for CIWs and case managers. So I want to be clear about uh, the urgency um, of this matter. Uh, we have not been able to extend award letters um, or execute contracts um, and just want to be very clear that in fact these resources do support salaries. Uh, they 90 percent of the grid budget supports contracts and contractual services uh, and so I'm hopeful that we will be able to address questions and concerns that you have um, and so that you feel confident today uh, to vote and move to, to transfer uh, the full 12.9 million dollars out of the UB uh, into the grid account so that we can get to the good work of uh, executing contracts um, to ensure the sustainability, not only of this work, but of the agencies uh, that do this important work. And so I'm happy to take any questions and address any concerns. Yes, thank you, Ms. Lane. Um, and to be clear, the, 30, the, the balance has already been allocated. This was, uh, again, what was placed into the UB, for those that are unfamiliar with it, was the detailed explanation of how this additional dollars would be allocated in that because that wasn't provided with greater clarity uh, as we were deliberating with the budgetary process, which is why we scheduled this uh, here in committee so that we could actually delineate exactly how these dollars were going to be expended because that wasn't previously provided. That being said, um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to see the sustainment, the projected sustainment of the work of, of uh, Project TURN. And so among the 12 million that we're talking about is an additional, the 4.65 plus the 2.8 uh, that would be uh, captured for the salaries of the community intervention workers of that 12.9, correct? The salaries, that does include those line items. It also includes uh, salaries for uh, reimagined surge um, ambassadors. It includes salaries for uh, those who are working in juvenile diversion. Uh, it will also include uh, salaries for youth who are involved in the summer night lights as well as young adults and seasonal uh, workers. So again, all of the contracts that GRID uh, enters into with community-based organizations um, are provide support for their staff who then execute uh, the grid's comprehensive uh, strategy in their respective communities. So, so the only the only line items that do not include uh, s actual salaries uh, of members of or nonprofit organizations uh, would be the the resources for Cal State LA. That's our evaluation partner. Social Solutions is our database. So that's a company that we contract with for our, our database. Uh, and then the gun buyback, um, also that doesn't, um, is not tied to a contract uh, for nonprofit organizations. Um, and then finally, uh, we've, we've asked for a, a small increase for grid staff uh, who support uh, implementation of the work. So in the last budget cycle, one of, uh, one of the items that was revealed in the, uh, that uh, grid didn't apply for the remaining dollars in the, that was uh, in the budget uh, allocated in the UB, there was never a submittal from GRID for those dollars. Um, have, is there, are all the contracts paid current? Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's that's good. So um, my, and my, then, okay. my, my understanding from the past administration uh, that 
because we have the, the program depends on whether we execute contracts by July 1, uh, there are decisions made around reduction in services um, and programming so that uh, GRID was able to actually execute contracts. So again, I can't speak with great specificity around uh, the prior administration's decisions, but what I know, uh, what we, we uh, inherited as the new administration is that contracts were executed um, and other programming was actually reduced in order uh, to do that. So then at this time, all the contractors that are providing intervention services are all current in terms of their payouts for their existing contracts? Uh, uh, pay, we, we accept invoicing. Our closeout period extends uh, beyond June 30th. Government, maybe you can. That's correct. So all of our, uh, even though our contract performance period ends on June 30th, the contract closeout actually happens a couple of months after that because we're on a three month cycle. Um, so the closeout of 22-23 fiscal year will actually happen during the 23-24 fiscal period. Okay. So uh, just because I know some of the uh, service providers, like in my community, they were saying that they were six months in arrears from getting paid. So my question is, have those, and, and those are paid out of the staff in the grid office, correct? That is correct. We okay, so if that's if that's paid out of there, I'm just I'm just curious in terms of what the what the lag is in making sure that they're paid on time, uh, that that those contracts are current. So you're saying this last segment, this last quarter, is going to be covered in the next fiscal year. So um, what, I think there's uh, two um, issues at play. Uh, so in terms of our ongoing annual contracts, as agencies invoice the city. Uh, we pay those invoices out in 30 days. And the last fiscal year, uh, GRID received uh, two grants, uh, one grant from the County of Los Angeles and the other from the state. Uh, unfortunately, and I, this is a citywide issue, um, it took uh, about six to seven months um, to go from, um, th throughout the entire approval process for the city to actually receive the dollars. And so that has created a significant, um, that created a significant delay in the payment um, of those uh, invoices that were, were, rela were related to the grant. And so I know this is a conversation that you all are having in city council um, around how can we you know, expedite uh, th that process. And so that's the sp uh, particular instance that I think agencies within CD7 and other districts are experiencing. It's related to the receipt of grant funds. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to work with the county, um, as all of you uh, do uh, on different circumstances, to, um, they have a process around um, how they do grants and we have a process of how we receive them. Um, and so we need them to work more in harmony uh, mm -hmm. so that we're able to access those resources so, because we need them in the city. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be able to do it so that agencies are not uh, disadvantaged by it. Okay. I, I appreciate that clarity because I think what often gets misrepresented is that there's some part of this process that is obstructing the payment for these uh, for these agencies to be able to pay their workers and nothing could be further from the truth as you just indicated is that it was contingent upon the county releasing their dollars in this grant. Uh, this had nothing to do with this pot of money because I think that gets misconstrued conveniently uh, by certain agencies. Um, were there any questions? Colleagues, for any of the ways. So the only last question that I had was um, the, the training that the CIWs receive that are part of this half million dollar allocation as proposed at the 12.9, um, how different is the programming uh, with respect to the training that is being provided in the sustainment of uh, TURN? So uh, the city of Los Angeles uh, has developed a uh, a model for a training for entry-level CIWs, and we refer to that as LaVita. Um, we um, put out an RFP uh, to secure uh, uh, an agency to actually implement that training. So LaVita is intended to support entry-level um, individuals who are coming into the field uh, to set a standard around um, intervention and, and the standards for CIWs. Um, 
the turn uh, work is different in, in two ways. Um, Reverence Pro Project has provided services uh, to uh, actually support CIWs around trauma. So it is a, an additional support. Uh, Maximum Force has provided um, a, a training uh, for CIWs around conflict resolution. So it is, um, I would describe it more as continued professional development. Uh, it, whereas our Levita training is for base level so that we have a clear idea uh, no matter what agency you work for, what part of the city you work for or work in, um, that we have a baseline of all CIWs being trained um, effectively. Great. So, Mr. Soto Martinez. Yeah, I, I just want to make uh, some, some comments. Thank you so much for the, the thorough explanation of all the items uh, that we're giving here in the report. Just for all the folks that were here, you know, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, and I've said this a few times to my colleagues, but, you know, I, I, I dropped out in the ninth grade, uh, and I was on probation as a juvenile. Um, and many of my friends that I grew up in those, you know, junior high years, high school years, uh, they're not around. Uh, some of them are dead. Uh, some of them are in jail. Some of them are in homelessness and could go in and out of homelessness, and I was the only one that graduated from college. Uh, that actually graduated from high school and went to college and graduated college. Now, I, I didn't have GRID um, at that time. I don't think it existed. This was, I graduated in 2001. But I had a teacher. I had a teacher who, who, who cared about me, and he intervened, right? He intervened and, and put me on the right path. And, uh, when I was in college, uh, my way to pay back the community was to be an intern uh, at the public defender's office with the juvenile, uh, juvenile system. And so the, the work that y'all do is very spe special. It's very unique. Uh, I think the, the population, uh, the issues they're facing, the trauma, uh, the things that they experience every given day in the streets, uh, it, it's, it's just very different. And so. Um, the need to the city is so much larger uh, than what we're giving, um, uh, but you know. But I'm glad to hear that people will be making more money. Uh, you know, you deserve a living wage. Uh, I hope. I wish we could pay you more. Uh, you know, it's it's the work you do is. I know it's a labor of love, but uh, you know, I'm I'm happy to see that. You know, it sounds like we're gonna fund this completely, like totally, move it out of the UB into because it's it's such a valuable resource and. Um, I say that because it's my own personal experiences, and so I was a lucky one, right? But there are a lot that were not lucky um, to move on. So just, again, thank you so much for the work and for everyone here doing the amazing work as well. Thank you. Um, Ms. Park. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you to all of our GRID partners for joining us today to speak to this invaluable program that makes such a difference across our entire city. Um, I, I specifically wanted to acknowledge the folks who are here today from Moms Demand Action. Um, you know, I, I have the unfortunate distinction of sharing a birthday with the tragedy at Sandy Hook. I will never forget December 14th, 2012, as long as I live, and none of us should. And I just want to thank you and acknowledge you for the work that you've done in your partnership with every town for gun safety, I had uh, the honor of being a gun sense distinguished candidate, and you're gonna have my partnership to do everything in my power to address gun violence by getting guns off our streets, disarming domestic abusers, and making sure that we continue working together to move the needle um, on gun violence. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about standing up alternative responses in Los Angeles, but GRID is an example of just that. I know that GRID has made a huge difference in my district, for example, through the work of Stan Mohammed at Helper Foundation. And I don't know if Mr. Mohammed is still in the room, but I, I, I just want to point out that from founding Venice 2000 and brokering the deal that essentially ended gang violence in, in Venice through his work that continues today with youth intervention work around music and arts and youth workforce development. He has, and the Helper Foundation, has changed and impacted lives and made things safer 
in the parts of our city where the helper organization operates. As we talk about trying to reduce violence in our city, we have got to make the investments, not only in the programming, but in the employees and the workers who are out there on the front lines doing this every single day. Uh, and I just, I, I want to say that I am really excited today to cast an I vote. This is an investment in our city. It is an investment in public safety. And I am so appreciative to all of our grid partners for the tremendous work that they do in Los Angeles. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I had a question regarding the Summer Night Lights program and any efforts to recalibrate the work that's happening there and any coordination with the Youth Development Department. Uh, has, has there been any discussions uh, around how to actually take what is the Summer Night Lights program and help to facilitate connecting young people with some of the programmatic opportunities that we offer in the city? So uh, this year we have been very intentional to uh, really work uh, to expand uh, the programming and, and really to deepen partnership uh, across the city uh, to ensure that we have an effective just summer period in Los Angeles, but in particular really leveraging summer night lights as a way um, to increase safety in communities, but also to afford young people and families in particular uh, communities with really, you know, the activities that other parts of the affluent parts of the city have um, all the time, right? Uh, and so this year what we've been, uh, we've done is that we've been working very closely with council district offices, um, the recreation um, Record and parks, because I always say it, the, the, the wrong way and Jimmy gets mad at me, uh, <laughs> recreation and parks, um, as well as LAPD. Uh, to have a robust, uh, a robust summer uh, at, 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 at within the, the targeted parks. Uh, we've also worked uh, with council district offices to identify um, not only in the parks, also in um, all three housing developments in CD15. Uh, and so we have identified in all of the, the, target, the, the sites um, small business opportunities within districts. Uh, so we're uh, looking for, a, uh, we have a started to contract with small restaurants to provide uh, food, small vendors to provide uh, re other materials that we use during summer night lights. So really having um, summer night lights uh, be something that the community owns. Um, and that's really an evidence-based practice. Um, it's a built, it's based off the idea that in the built environment, if you fill open spaces with family activities, healthy activities, you can actually make the areas around it safer. Um, and our evaluation demonstrates that to be true. Um, in, er in areas where we, in fact, have SNL sites, we've actually been able to reduce violent crime during those summer months. So it's an effective intervention. Um, again, uh, during the summer, we employ uh, with referrals from our prevention agencies and intervention agencies, we employ over 400 young people um, in uh, many of your districts. Um, many of those young people have gone through the city. They become actual, the, the beauty of the partnership with RAP is that they're actually employed through the city process. And so um, older uh, youth can actually move into a city job if it's available. Um, one of our staff from GRID uh, came through Summer Night Lights and we've had other, some, uh, other uh, uh, young people who went through SNL actually start to work for GRID. Uh, so we are excited this year that we are almost at capacity. Um, you know, COVID, it, it, we took a hit, um, but we have been active to recruit uh, young people, and we have most of our parks and, and, and HACLA sites um, are actually fully staffed with young people. We have cluster coordinators, site coordinators. We are in conversations with LAPD. Uh, one of the things that we heard both from council district offices as well as um, our community partners is that uh, folks wanted to see more um, in that involvement from LAPD. And so we've worked with LAPD um, to get pe um, the officers out of the cars and interacting with residents and young people in, in the SNL sites uh, this year. Um, and we also, again, uh, part of this budget ask is to support seasonal CIWs. So our, inner, our, our prevention agencies provide programming during <laughs> SNL. Um, again, their young people are often hired uh, through the SNL process. And then our intervention workers not only provide programming, uh, but they do the work to ensure that the space is safe. 
Um, so whether that be um, ensuring that there's agreements between neighborhoods, um, whether they're supplementing in areas where maybe there's not a park um, that can support a particular neighborhood, they're doing uh, programming, um, doing block parties. Um, and so we have all of those pistons moving this summer, and so we anticipate it to be a very successful uh, summer and will complement all of the things um, that you all are doing in your district. Um, as it relates to YDD, um, one of the things that we would like to do, um, one, generally is support YDT, YDD's um, expansion and, and capacity um, as a department. So that is a, a commitment from this administration. Um, this year we were not able to, uh, to actually incorporate them into the implementation of SNL, but one idea that we do have and we want to talk to the, the GM about is um, you know, recruitment for hiring. They're young people that they work with, obviously, um, should if they live in the, the districts in the, near the site, should have an opportunity for employment. Um, it is a great opportunity and a, a great way to, de to develop as a young person. Um, additionally, you know, we, we have summer night lights, but we, we often don't talk about our fall Fridays. Um, and so we want to talk to them about how they might be able to complement back to school type programming uh, to, uh, to really set the tone um, in, in communities. But um, that, that's what we're looking forward to, uh, but we, we were not able to incorporate them this year. Thank you, thank you. Tim? Well, I, I, I do want to just respond to that. You know, um, I really appreciate that we're in Jordan and Nickerson and Imperial. I mean, and, and it's significant too, I'll say for my, for my colleagues, that we don't have rec and parks. Right in the developments. And so to be in the developments where we, we don't have the rec and park infrastructure, which is a disappointment, but that's a different story. But to have um, um, summer night lights is fantastic. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Now last year it was a little bit truncated. I mean, I know that wasn't on your, on your shift um, uh, from the year before. It just seemed smaller and, and, and I think that when we don't invest in summer night lights when it's a little bit uh, short on funding and short on personnel, it, it has the effect of doing just the opposite of what we want to do. Yes. So I'm looking forward, forward to a very fulsome you know, set of, uh, of parks and our developments, and, and I uh, thank you very much for that. I do want to ask you, though, um, the Friday nights in the fall completely uh, you know, passed me by. I didn't even know we did it. I mean, can you just give a, a, a short version on what that is? So um, we, we also know um, that uh, there's often spikes in crimes right before school starts. And so uh, what we've tried to do is extend um, the intervention beyond the summer um, and to provide uh, safe spaces for community to come together and stay connected uh, through the fall. Um, and so I think fall, uh, fall Fridays ends about November. Um, about November. Uh, and so it's just on Friday, so it is a, a, a min a shorter abbreviated uh, program, but we provide prevention providers, intervention providers still continue to provide the services and programming that they do. Um, and we, we, we're not always at all 43 sites right. um, because of uh, you know, budgetary issues, but we try to target uh, sites where we anticipate there might be, um, where, there's, where there's the greatest need. So um, I don't know if we do far, fall Fridays, I'm looking at our program team at the HACLA sites. So, so that's an opportunity, Council Member, uh, to extend uh, Fall Fridays as, as well to the HACL sites. Let's just look forward for more information on that because we had great, great luck in combining with neighborhood councils and with other community groups uh, and to make sure that we had a lot of participation in um, Summer Night Lights. And, so. and, and that reminds me, Council Member, the other thing that we've done this year, uh, and, and my colleague Patty's not here, we've also reached out to neighborhood councils this year to yeah. sponsor a night. Um, at the sites, and so again, we're really trying to foster the sense of connectedness right. um, to increase that. So thank you for mentioning the neighborhood councils. Some some are have an appetite for it, for it others don't, but we're, we're looking for partnerships with them as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. And just my last question uh, is, the last comprehensive strategy that GRID uh, went through was uh, about three years ago, and obviously that was pre-pandemic, a lot has changed. Uh, is there, are there plans to revisit and kind of look at the strategies, how we might again amend, obviously deriving some of the lessons that we've learned from efforts like even Project Turn, uh, are we, you know, what is the, what are the plans in place for, for the evolution? 
So um, I've made the commitment to um, all of our grid agencies and even agencies um, that are not currently contracted with grid. Um, I'm proud to say that I've had relationships with the intervention field um, before coming to the city um, and recognize that many of even the agencies that spoke today don't have grid contracts. Um, they're really just a commitment to the work. And so my commitment uh, to all of them is to work with them to identify um, opportunities for growth. Um, and so that is a, a priority for us this year. Terrific, thank you. And seeing no other questions, uh, Mr. I'd like to recommend that we adopt the CAO's report. And uh, Mr. Verrano, if you'd please call the roll. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember McOsker. Yes. Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Four eyes, and this item is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, council members. I look forward to seeing you all soon and reporting on the success. Thank you. And now that brings us to item number three. Item number three is a Board of Fire Commissioners report relative to a standards of cover deployment analysis of the Los Angeles Fire Department. Thank you. So colleagues, uh, item number three on today's agenda is the conversation around the recommendations of the standards of cover analysis. It's a lengthy conversation. I'd ask the general public if you guys could please, we're still trying to conduct city business, if we could exit quietly. Thank you. Um, and so uh, this is a long time coming. Uh, I'm trying to recall when the instruction for the standards of cover analysis was created, but here we are today. I'm glad, uh, thank you, Chief Perez, for being with us today so that we could continue uh, reflection on our fire resources. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and honorable members of the committee. Excuse me, Mr. Perez. Excuse me, if we can have quiet in the hearing room. Thank you. Go ahead. My name is David Perez. I am a fire deputy chief, and I'm proud to serve as your chief of staff of your fire department. I'm here today to present to you the standards cover report and analysis uh, that has been conducted on our fire department's uh, response uh, throughout the city um, on both fire and EMS uh, type incidents. Uh, it's <clears throat> It's appropriate to note that uh, this type of study only really does look at fire and EMS calls. It does not look at um, the Port of LA fire boat type incidents. It does not look at fire inspectors or arson or air operations as there are no, no national standards uh, for response for those type, types of resources. Um, the report looks at a three year data set uh, it looked at the period from 19, I'm sorry, 2018 to 2020, um, and that was the point at which they began their work. Um, the original, going back to um, a comment you made, Madam Chair, um, the original request for a standards of cover was about 10 years ago, and we went through two failed RFPs before we finally got um, this RFP through, and, um, and then uh, a, a contract extension for a year uh, mostly due to the COVID problem. Uh, after we provided the data to CityGate, our contractor, um, then as they needed uh, additional information and reach out to other agencies uh, within our own department, we had pretty much shifted our entire mission to COVID response, uh, vaccination, and uh, testing missions. And so uh, we were unable to provide them with the timely information they needed. And that's what in fact caused the delay. Uh, regarding that delay, though, the information that we extrapolated uh, from the period of 2020 through 2022, the last completed calendar year, we saw no significant difference in the trends other than an increase in call load and perhaps a, a, a station that was the busiest might now be the second busiest at, in a swap like that, but no significant changes. So the, the data and the findings that they have here, we find to be um, all, all relevant today. Um, the findings are all listed in the report. There's uh, 17 findings and eight recommendations. Rather than read them all to you, unless that's what you'd like me to do, I'll let the uh, report speak for itself, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions that uh, this committee has. Thank you. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off with the questions, um, and, uh, and thank you. I just, uh, 
obviously there's a, there's a lot contained in, within the report and colleagues for uh, just to, for context. Uh, again, this report just kind of, it, it helps to lay out uh, where the gaps in service are, where we can help close some of those gaps potentially, uh, just to, to get kind of a primer for everybody. Uh, because I think, you know, we have our ideals for service delivery in the city. We have to figure out based within the constraints of our financial obligations, how we best achieve that going forward so that we can deliberate going forward with budgetary implications for hiring, what type of hiring, what kind of stations, what types of services we need to deploy in certain areas. Because certainly, as we all know, uh, Fire Station 31 that has never been fulfilled in the Northeast San Fernando Valley uh, is a high priority and, and represents an area of tremendous service gaps. Uh, we also still have uh, substantial, uh, we've never recovered from the recession-based cuts of staffing. Uh, there's still several engine companies which have not been restored, Fire Station 74 is in my district among them. So I know we have a lot of outstanding needs. My question is, uh, among the recommendations that were provided in the report, does the department uh, recommend and is in alignment uh, with those recommendations? Yes, ma'am, we, we do agree with, with most of them. We, we understand that there may be some, some issues, uh, particularly recommendation number three, which talks about uh, split shifting or rotating crews. Um, uh, labor has already indicated publicly that uh, um, that would be a meet and confer issue, which we're aware of, and indicate um, that they're probably not in favor of it. Um, I think most of these other uh, recommendations, um, maintaining our current response time goals in our reporting systems, uh, adding the battalion command team to the fire station 100 area, um, and looking particularly in, in number four, refining and building the case to shift the low acuity EMS incidents from firefighter staffed RAs uh, to non-firefighter staffed low acuity units to include medical, mental health care, and homeless resources. Um, that's where we're going to be focusing, I would say, the majority of our, uh, of our efforts um, to try to develop better systems for handling those types of calls. Um, our advanced uh, provider response units, APRUs, which is a, uh, um, a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner with a firefighter paramedic on board, uh, to handle a lot of these lower acuity calls that are easily handled in the patient's home. They're provided the medications that they, that they need and, and uh, no additional hospital contact or doctor's contact required. Um, that's a far uh, better model than simply having two firefighter paramedics or two firefighter EMTs put the patient in the back of the ambulance to take them to a hospital uh, where now that we're stuck waiting for a bed to come available. Um, so it's a more efficient model. Um, so we're, we are looking at those. They provide us the highest um, amount of uh, flexibility in terms of what they can do. Um, also, the fast response vehicles, which are also staffed with firefighters. But we're also looking now at, um, we've just recently um, sent to the field a class of eight emergency appointed paramedics. These are non-sworn members who will be entering uh, through the emergency appointment program into the uh, class of temporary paramedic. Um, they'll work for about a year, and then in that year, our hope is to get them in through the, the Firefighter Academy where they will become sworn. In the meantime, it's helping to take a, um, a little bite out of the EMS call load. Uh, we also have another group, I believe it's a, a little around 76 people uh, off the new um, firefighter list pool that are paramedic certified and have shown an interest to go into the next emergency appointed paramedic class. Um, Doubtful that we would be able to take all 76 once we get them through the, the, the background and uh, testing process, but many of them uh, will make it through and we'll be able to uh, continue with that program as well. Uh, also, just last week, we uh, um, completed the class um, acceptance for uh, emergency appointed EMTs. So again, these are not, they're not coming in as sworn members originally, but they're gonna be working on ambulances in the cases of the EMTs on BLS ambulances for a period of time until we can get them into the drill tower. So we are looking at, at those types of um, resources, um, which are new and, and, um, and, and show a difference. They also give us the ability with these additional resources to perhaps go into a 12-hour resource deployment model, 
with those resources. So the 24-hour resources stay the way they are, but now with these new resources we can add in at half of the cost of a 24-hour resource and put them in our most critical times of the day, which is between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., uh, which was brought out in the unit hour utilization uh, part of this report. Um, so we, we take away, we take the bite out of the where, very worst part of the day where we are busiest, where, where we are putting a strain on our, our resources. We were able to um, flatten that curve, so to speak, and, um, and, and provide a better service without having to add 24-hour resources um, to our mix. Um, so that, um, hopefully yeah, that answers your question. Thank you. Colleagues, are there any questions? Ms. Okay, Ms. Park. Thank you so much, and thank you, Chief, for, for being here. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I just want to say that after having looked at all of this for the time and, and the work that went into this, you know, with all due respect, it feels really incomplete to me, the report. Um, it seems to conclude that our firefighters and paramedics are incredibly overworked and yet there's no real acknowledgement or recommendations in here around mental health. There's no acknowledgement of the number of forced tires, the back to back to back shifts that our firefighters and paramedics are working. While I appreciate the recommendation to add one new fire station, that doesn't seem adequate in a city of four million people where we have 106, and I, I want to point this out because I think by comparison, it's interesting. In my council district, the 11th on the west side, um, I have about 80 square miles of geography, and I have 10 stations outside of LAX. I have one behind uh, at LAX. That is about one station per 30,000 constituents. In contrast, the city of Santa Monica, which sits right in the middle of my district, 8.4 square miles in geography, 90,000 residents, and five fire stations. So that's one for about 18,000 people. So I'm just saying that by comparison, this doesn't feel adequate. Uh, I think the recommendation to add another 14 ambulances is, is great. We need to talk about funding to do that. but. It, did the folks from City Watch go to Metro Fire Communications and see the red on the board? Because I did, and I was alarmed by the swaths of red around the city where there were no RAs available. And so I, I, I think it's important, and I'm glad that this work has been done, but I am concerned that I don't see a recommendation here about getting those staffing levels up to where we've been and addressing the reduction in staffing despite ongoing population growth in our city. I mean, you know as well as anyone, fire department responds to a 911 call every 35 seconds. It's not sustainable at the levels that we're at. And so I, I appreciate the work that's, that's gone into this. I just want to note, I, I don't think it goes far enough. Ms. Park, and just to be clear, um, what this ass assessment does, because uh, and, and I think, and that's why I asked the question of the chief is, you know, of these recommendations, which are, you know, are you in alignment with all of them? Those are policy decisions and budgetary de recommendations that we as a council uh, and the mayor uh, need to be part of deliberating on and actively choosing when we look at all of our resources to say, how do we resource the fire department? How do we resource all of our competing priorities in the city? And so uh, this is a, a baseline assessment of uh, acknowledging where our gaps are. Uh, clearly, as I indicated, uh, this for, for decades uh, since the 2008 recession and the reductions were done, um, there's been incremental restoration of the resources through the securing of safer grants through, uh, again, you know, and if, if not for some of those federal grants uh, to help us secure the resources to actually buy the engine companies and start the initial staffing levels, 
we would still be at a you know even further deficit than from where we started. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we were able to restore Fire Station 75's engine company in my district as a result of one of those safer grants early in my term. Um, so uh, you know, just again, I, I you know I, I want to make sure that we're directing our our um, you know uh, again we've got the power to help change this. And this is, for me, uh, one of those eye-openers because I too have been to OCD. We, we know how, uh, how uh, stretched our fire personnel are. Uh, we still remain at a staffing level deficit that thus requires them to work substantial sod days in order to help close the service need gaps that we have in the city. Uh, that being said, it's why we also, for example, uh, have been piloting other initiatives like the APRUs and the therapeutic mental health vans and some of these other initiatives so that it can actually relieve the emergency response and the rescues from some of the call loads, much like what we've seen with LAPD. Uh, in absence of any other support services, they get sent to every call. And so this is part of, I think, the larger effort and conversation that we are engrossed in with respect to alternatives, um, helping to rightly align a lot of our resources uh, so that we can better support the men and women of our LA City Fire Department, but more importantly, have a positive outcome with respect to our response times and making sure that we are full, you know, as someone who has, uh, you know, had to endure in my district three major wildfires in my first term, um, you know, I'm so thankful that we didn't sustain some of the same substantial losses that we saw in many other parts of California, and it's because of our uh, shared response and uh, unified command with the county and everything. We, we, you know, our department has a really outstanding model of unified command, and, and I think that has, has been uh, one of our silver linings, and we've been very fortunate for that. But I think, again, this to go forward, what is going to be critical is it, how it informs our uh, our roadmap going forward for the restoration of services and prioritization of the hiring, the staffing levels, and to what to which areas we allocate those resources. Um, but uh, and so you know, I'm, I'm just I'm glad this is finally done. We've been I've been asking for this uh, for several years, and I know COVID uh, continued to slow that that progress. But I'm glad it's. It's, uh, we're finally here with this. Uh, Mr. McCosford, did you have a? Just a quick observation, thank you very much, appreciate that. Just a quick observation, you know, in the north end, and I'm gonna go to my district, north end of Battalion 6, really uh, going under, it's go going through a lot of change. I mean, I expect we're gonna see a lot more, um, you know, high-rise development. I'm hoping we're gonna see a lot more uh, residential development that'll be multifamily, and 79s will be just swamped. I know we have good mutual aid, but but uh, does this, are, are we gonna use this, this study and this plan to kind of look at where we, uh, and again, going to, um, uh, going to my colleague's observation that we need more resources. Are we looking at more stations? Uh, are we looking at um, you know, opportunities to expand? Because I feel like, again, Battalion 6, pretty well served in the south end, really uh, under-resourced at the north end. Yes, sir, particularly in the Harbor Gateway. Yeah. Um, we are actually looking at, at, at uh, th what this helps us do is is put um, a model now to how we can try to um, site additional stations. Um, and also what this does is this forms the basis now for going forward on, pa on perhaps, uh, we, we plan on coming to council with a proposal to uh, establish a fire development services fee. Um, that would be based on um, the type of square footage, so on, on any new development, that whether it's residential or commercial or industrial uh, square footage, uh, a certain fee would be assessed, and that would eventually go to a fire station develop, uh, building fund, rather than um, bond measures, which are one-time quick um, infusions of, of money to build a fire station, but then the cost of the um, uh, interest over time uh, makes them more expensive than not uh, versus this fee. This part, one of the benefits of this study being complete is that it, it helps going on to the next step, which is the nexus study between fire development and, and fire station uh, construction. 
Um, so that's one of the benefits of this. But yes, um, we are looking at the fact that um, the city is starting to grow vertically rather than horizontally. Yep. And that increases population density and we have to be able to be prepared to handle the additional EMS call volume that goes with that. Uh, we don't anticipate a large fire call volume necessarily because these new buildings will be built to, to code and um, so they have fire protection systems in it. Not to say that they don't, they don't uh, catch fire occasionally, but uh, the, the bigger increase will be in EMS call load. Uh, one of the additional things we're looking at building is rather than always just building fire stations, to start looking at building ambulance stations yeah. where there may not be a fire engine in yeah. that particular facility because it's, it's served well uh, by firefighting resources, but what we really need in that area is more ambulances. And um, so to have ambulance facilities that might also have a portion of the facility dedicated to um, you know, community health, or mental health mm -hmm. as well um, is something that we'll be looking at as we go forward. I see. I appreciate that. I mean, looking at a, not that I'm signing off on it, but looking at a fee structure like that uh, reflects the additional square footage, the types of uh, construction, whether it's residential or commercial or industrial, and, and uh, I would imagine you'd propose that you shape the fee to the needs of what services would be put into that particular area. Yes, sir, that's part of the nexus study that would have to come next before we could even bring that before the council. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Are th were there any other questions or comments? Um, Tracy, you're good? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you so much, Chief. Appreciate it. Glad we were able to, to finally get this scheduled. And uh, Mr. Verano, I'd like to recommend that we note and file. And uh, if you'd please call the roll. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember McOsker. Yes. Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Four eyes, and this item is noted and filed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item number four. Stay with me, folks. We're we're gonna jam through this. I promise. Item I'm normally much more succinct and efficient than this, but we've had a lot of presentations with a lot of overdue. Uh, these were some of the most critical reports, and we've been wanting to get these things scheduled, so we want to get these through. Item number four is a city administrative officer and personnel department reports relative to the proposed sworn and civilian hiring incentive program for the Los Angeles Police Department. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Munhall? I'm sorry. Uh, Tyler Munhall, CAO, uh, Chair, Committee Members. I can briefly summarize the CAO report. We also have personnel as well as the Police Department folks here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, my quick question would be, is the CAO, uh, are, are we able to track or anticipate the number of bonuses uh, that we expect uh, through this process? We will be. Uh, we and personnel can weigh in on this. They are actively working on uh, adapting Workday to do just that. Um, Police will also have a role in tracking payments, um, but it, it's looking like personnel will be tracking, you know, somebody got hired, so that, that's one payment. They've reached 18 months, that's one payment, and then 36. But I'll defer to personnel if you guys want to add anything. Okay. Hi, Aaron McCraney with Personal Department, Assistant General Manager, and this is um, Melissa Amamato. Um, and yes, just exactly as you identified, we want to have a, a bifurcator system where both personnel and police department tracks because we want to understand our effectiveness of our advertisement and of our outreach. And at the same time, because it's with the, per the police department, I think it's better served that they actually have a system so they can identify the payouts and the timing of when that does occur. Okay. And we're going to be utilizing the workday system to actually uh, get that done. Great. And then on the civilian, uh, on the civilian bonuses, are we talking about? Cap have we captured all of the opportunities of civilian hire? Well, we went by what was the recommendation from the police department regarding the person, um, the priority, what they felt was most important. And right now, the need for PSR, police mm -hmm. service representative, is of highest uh, need. Um, also, next to that is going to be the polygraph examiner mm -hmm. uh, because that directly impacts being able to hire and are sworn. Every person that's hired 
uh, as a police officer, has to go through a polygraph exam. And if there's not enough people or not enough appointments that are made, that impacts the ability to hire sworn. So it's so we still haven't even opened it up to the full scope of civilian possibilities. Well, right now we're starting with the um, polygraph examiner. We're starting with the PSR, PSR security officer, and uh, what's our fourth? Detention, detention no. officer. And detention officer. Okay. Um, questions? I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, this question was answered before because I asked if there was other incentive programs for different uh, classifications. I don't think, to this day, I don't think we have any for other than police department, right? Correct. Yeah, okay, so I just want, for my colleagues, I, I will be voting no on this item because I do think when we think about the larger issues of the city, sanitation, broken sidewalks, I think the necessity is for every department, not just you know the, the few that we have here. But I just wanted to say, so I clarify why I'm voting no. Thank you. Um, and so with that, thank you so much uh, for hanging on here with us. It's, I know it's a long meeting. And uh, Mr. Verano, I'd like to uh, recommend that we approve the CAO's report. And if you'd please call the roll. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember McOsker. Yes. Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. No. Three ayes, one no, and this item is approved. OK. And uh, ch -ch 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 We'll take item uh, 18. Item number 18 is a Los Angeles Fire Department report relative to a second amendment to memorandum of agreement between the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health and the city, acting by and through the Los Angeles Fire Department, contract number C-139192 for the Therapeutic Transport Pilot Program. Thank you. Chief? Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, Tyler Dixon, Assistant Chief, uh, assigned to the EMS Bureau for the Los Angeles City Fire Department. Thank you. And so, um, I, you know, I know what we have before us is the request for the extension uh, of the, uh, the contract that we have with the county. And so, uh, and we I know we have a pending report uh, with the CLA uh, that they're working on about the expansion or consolidation of the programs. And so, um, if you could just give a very brief presentation and uh, then we'll go into any questions and go from there. Yes, Matt. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Members, thank you for having me today. Uh, what you have before you is a request to extend the pilot program that uh, involves the Department of Mental Health, the County of Los Angeles Department of Mental Health partnered with the Los Angeles Fire Department to deploy five therapeutic vans that facilitate uh, DMH or Department of Mental Health staff responding alongside fire department staff or fire department resources to 911 calls that are received by the Los Angeles Fire Department that are triaged to involve a mental health crisis. Uh, the pilot allows for normal response uh, of a EMT or paramedic resource and a non-emergency response by a Department of Mental Health therapeutic van. The therapeutic van staff will arrive subsequent to an EMT or paramedic conducting a normal patient assessment and using a clearance algorithm to determine appropriateness to transfer care of someone suffering an isolated mental health emergency that does not involve a medical complaint, a violence, or an overdose to a Department of Mental Health personnel, a licensed psychiatric technician paired with a social uh, worker or peer worker and a driver. The Department of Mental Health staff then have the ability to transport the person experiencing an isolated mental health emergency to an alternative facility rather than an emergency department, alternative facility being a psychiatric urgent care center. Uh, the pilot uh, is scheduled to end at the end of this month and we are requesting to renew the pilot for another 12 months uh, starting on July 1st. Uh, that would renew the five therapeutic vans that are deployed throughout the city uh, and it would allow the uh, fire department to continue the partnership with these five vans uninterrupted. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCosker, I know you had a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so in the, in the harbor area, we're at 40s on the island and the statistics show that uh, it's lightly used 
uh, and um, I've had I've had the experience of calling for it myself a couple of times, not for myself, although some days I feel maybe I should, um, but <laughs> without success. And um, I'm really uh, I don't know if it's because uh, the the resources on the island um, at 40s, or I don't know if it's because it's understaffed. It's often not staffed by by county personnel, and it might not often be staffed by county personnel because there's few calls. It's a chicken and egg problem. Uh, but it's about to get worse because we're going to redeck the, the bridge on the island, and so it will be completely unavailable uh, to much of the rest of the district. And so I'm not, uh, while I'm a fan of this idea and this program, if it w were to work, it's simply not working in the harbor area. I don't have a question, although I would ask you for a response. Yes, sir. Uh, th there's several possibilities as to why in the two particular instances you refer to that the, the therapeutic man assigned to Fire Station 40's district uh, was not available. One could potentially be that it was unstaffed due to Department of Mental Health uh, staff not being available for any number of reasons, mm -hmm. uh, compensated time off or, or other challenges that the DMH or Department of Mental Health have had with staffing. Um, they have had struggles onboarding uh, on top of just normal uh, uh, temporary out outages. Um, the pilot calls for five vans to operate on the 24-7 uh, schedules uh, minus uh, the county approved uh, holidays. Um, however, they've only been able to onboard staff to staff two of the therapeutic vans on a 24-hour schedule and three of them on a 12-hour AM schedule so far. Um, so. That could be one possibility. Um, the volume with which you've indicated that therapeutic band 40 has, has seen, you are correct. The, the call volume of that particular resource within that particular dispatch range mm -hmm. uh, has been less than one transport per shift and potentially even in times less than one dispatch per shift. Mm -hmm. um, to your particular instance, is I'd, I'd need to look into the details up to the two that you've made, um, it, it could also be a potential that it was triaged out by the dispatcher. Uh, in information could have indicated that it didn't fit the particular dispatch algorithm for that therapeutic van, even though there was a right. mental health emergency. There could have been some other criteria that indicated that they weren't available. But um, happy to look at those specific ones if you'd like to. Um, no, your well, there you, I can give them to you. You can look at them. But I think I know how it came out. In one case, I think there was insufficient staffing, and so we mm -hmm. sent a different resource. Uh, and in the other case, um, it did show, it took a while, it did show, and the checklist is so difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, very few of these cases make it through the checklist. And so it, it almost seems like a false hope uh, to give a call to the therapeutic van. In my personal experience, limited to uh, my two times I've called and also stories I've heard throughout my district. And again, this is the only resource I have. Uh, may I respond to that? Yes. I agree with you, sir, that the checklist does uh, narrow the window for opportunity for the therapeutic van to accept the transfer of a, a patient that has been identified as a 911 patient for the fire department is extremely narrow. The primary reason for that is the therapeutic van does not have any capability or certification to provide any kind of medical care whatsoever. It, it is a narrow window, again, that uh, isolated psychiatric emergency, the patient has to be, or the, the person experiencing a mental health crisis does need to be cooperative. Uh, again, the therapeutic van does not have any ability to deal with a violent person or somebody that is uncooperative or unwilling to accept those services. And there cannot be any kind of uh, drug overdose or, or other intoxication involved. Um, the checklist is created in collaboration with uh, the Department of Health Services local EMS agency, which is the regulatory authority for all EMS providers in the County of Los Angeles. And it is created to allow this, this pilot, a proof of concept pilot for, again, that very narrow window. Um, the early takeaways from the pilot is that that, that very narrow window, um, it, it will not go away based on this, this particular staffing model. Uh, the report that the, the um, Madam Chair referred to uh, describing the assessment with the CLA working with the fire department of the multitude of resources that are available through the fire department to respond to medical emergencies that involve 
psychiatric emergencies. Um, will include a description of the, and comparison of the advanced provider response unit that my colleague referred to earlier in the standards of cover report that allows for a multitude of delivery mechanisms in one platform. This uh, advanced provider response unit, again, is staffed by an advanced provider being a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, uh, which is either a master's degree or doctorate level provider, a mid-level provider. Uh, you can normally find these types of uh, providers as far as emergency medicine in an urgent care setting or an emergency room type setting, providing similar services that a physician would. And they're partnered with a firefighter paramedic that also has additional specialized training. This platform allows for uh, high acuity, uh, significant uh, medical complaints, low acuity medical complaints, and also can provide a, the ability to clear uh, a person for a psychiatric urgent care center uh, outside of that checklist that you referred to, sir. The checklist that you referred to is specific to a firefighter paramedic or an EMT scope of practice. A physician assistant or a nurse practitioner has a much broader scope of practice, very similar to a physician in, this, in many of these cases, and could allow for a larger uh, patient population that's suffering from a psychiatric, urgent, a psychiatric emergency that may have a medical problem that would be eliminate them from the checklist, but this advanced provider could potentially clear a larger population for psychiatric urgent care centers. Um, so coupled with the low acuity um, increase in call volume that we have experienced across the fire department, uh, this, this platform uh, allows us to explore maybe a broader sense of that. But I believe that's probably another motion. Uh, for right, so Mr. McCosker, what we're looking at in terms of the TMVs, you know, as we have a comprehensive assessment of all of the alternative deployments that we have, uh, in the conversation of the extension of, uh, the possible extension with the county of these services, because I, I recognize there ha it hasn't been uh, as wildly successful in some areas as others. Uh, I think also the assignments from where, from, you know, the, where they're being deployed is also one of the challenges. If you look at FOURS, FOURS has, had, has been wildly successful. Yep. Uh, in, in my district, in 77s, we've, we've had success too. I think the timing with which some of the staffing levels still, they're not at full 24-7 uh, at, at all the deployments. Uh, but we need, you know, the support and the cooperation of the county supervisors. Uh, because it was uh, it was through that partnership that they uh, delineated that they wanted one in each supervisorial district, and so it limited our ability to be able to deploy these resources uh, in design or in response to where our heaviest call loads were. Uh, rather, but it was it was limited to you know where they wanted us to help define uh, the uh, the dispatch locations, and so I think you know the other conversation that we need to have should. Uh, the supervisors agree to continuing the support and you know again there you know you you launch something in a pilot you refine it you continue to yeah. uh, adapt it so that it's more responsive to the needs uh, but I think going forward what we also need to talk about is uh, the alternative dispatch locations that are more attuned to the uh, the call loads and the needs that we have not just limiting it to our uh, stations but looking at whatever other uh, dispatch dispatch locations so might be better suited. That's a great point. I mean, I, I, I can't possibly be supportive of it. Of, I mean, I appreciate that it works everywhere else, but I can't be supportive of it at 40s in, on the Terminal Island. It is ineffective now and will be less effective when we start doing the construction on the bridge. Um, but I have an abandoned fire station in the middle of, in the middle of uh, uh, San Pedro on Mesa Street. I mean, literally an abandoned fire station uh, that's in terrible condition, by the way, but that's a different story. I mean, I would, be, I would be all for relocating it and seeing if it works uh, and see, seeing if just the location was the failure. But I have, would have to say it's a failure in my district. Well, I, you know, again, and, and the experiences in other areas, everyone's going to have a different experience. Yeah. And so, yeah. uh, you know, again, these are, these are critical mental health resources that we otherwise haven't been uh, the recipient of. Uh, and so for that... Uh, you know, making sure that we continue to engage in the conversation, adapt it as necessary, as necessary so that it can be more effective in those areas of deployment. I know other areas that would actually like to have it, 
uh, Ms. Ms. Parker says, bring it to, ben to Venice. Uh, so, I, you know, I think obviously there's a lot of uh, massaging of, uh, of these resources, uh, but, uh, but with that, um, were there any other questions from any, no? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, I'd like to move that we approve the fire department's request for authority to execute a second amendment to the MOA to extend the term of the therapeutic mental health ban pilot program as specified. Uh, Mr. Verano, if you'd please call the roll. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember McOsker. I'll be a yes. Councilmember Park. Oh, Councilmember yes. Soto Martinez. <laughs> kind of feel like voting no, then Tim voted yes, but I'll, I'll vote yes. Four ayes, and this item is approved. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Verano, if you'd please call item 11. Item number 11 is a Board of Police Commissioners report relative to the Narcotics Analysis Laboratory Trust Fund expenditure budget for fiscal year 2023-24. Thank you. Mr. Soto Martinez, I knew you had questions. No, just for a separate vote. No, oh, for a separate vote. Yes. Okay. So never mind. We're good. We're just going to no. take a separate vote. Uh, Mr. Verano, I'd like to recommend the approval. If you'd please call the roll. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember McOsker. Yes. Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. No. Three ayes or one no. This item is approved. Thank you. Uh, for item 15, is that just a separate vote or? Yes, Madam Chair. Perfect. Okay. Item number 15 is our City Administrative Officer and Board of Police Commissioners reports relative to the fiscal year 2022 Law Enforcement Agency De-Escalation Community Policing Development Grant Application and Award. Okay, like to recommend the approval. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember McOsker. Yes. Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember Soto Martinez. No. <laughs> Three ayes and one no. This item is approved. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I know it was a weighty agenda, but uh, now we are clear till August. So thank you very much. I see that there's no other items on the desk. The desk is clear, Madam Chair. We are adjourned. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Nothing till...